Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, special edition of a live stream. Uh, welcome, everyone, in the chat, and most importantly, welcome to our guys <laughs> in the chat room. Welcome, Alex Pfeffer, Daniel James, Blake Robinson, and Christopher Sue. Hello. Uh, before we jump straight in, what I would love to do is just have each and every one of you give a quick information about yourself, who you are, what you do, in case some people don't know you. So, Alex, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, so hi, I'm the grandfather, basically, of this group here right now. <laughs> so, no, I'm uh, Alex Pepper. My name is Alex Pepper. I'm a composer, sound designer from Hamburg. I'm doing this for 15 years now, and I have worked on quite a few video games and, you know, trailer licensed tracks. And um, I play guitar, and you may have heard of me uh, from, from a few YouTube videos or a few, you know, games or whatever. And I'm pretty stoked to be here tonight. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Chris, how about you? Yeah, well, if Alex is the grandfather, I'm the baby, so um, I'm very excited <laughs> to be here as well. And when I, when I got the invitation, I was like, "Wow!" I mean, I'm very honored, and I really appreciate you know having the opportunity to talk, you know chat with you guys. It's very exciting. So I'm a I'm a pianist, and I uh, started off as a singer songwriter um, a few years ago, and then transitioned to kind of writing orchestral music a couple of years back when I discovered sample libraries. I was like, "Wow, this is a really cool." advancement of technology compared to what we had before now with all the you know virtual instruments and everything we've got it's just amazing what we can do so uh it's just been a lot of fun and um yeah again just super excited to be here and looking forward to chatting with everybody thanks for being here much appreciated thank you mr james what do you can say hi i'm daniel james and i'm an alcoholic no uh wrong meeting no uh yeah my name's daniel james i'm a uh Primarily video game composer, I guess, and uh, I also do some film stuff. Um, I'm I'm neither the baby nor the granddad. I sort of fit <laughs> nicely tucked in the middle there. I'm not sure what that is. The kid? I'm the kid. No, that that would be yeah. The teenager. I know. I'm I'm the middle aged <laughs> uncle of the group. Um, <laughs> oh, and I, uh, you know, I do YouTube. Uh, I started in 2009, and I've actually been documenting my entire career through YouTube. Um, so literally from from like my first project talking. Well, pretending like I know what I'm talking about, but, you know, explaining my process <laughs> process back in the day uh, all the way up till uh, now, you know, so you get to see when I, I fail and when I've uh, when I've succeeded, things like that. But now I, I stream on Twitch with the with the lovely dear and Alex here. And well, you, you all stream on Twitch now, right? No, I've so. never streamed on Twitch. Nah. <laughs> nah, nah, too lazy for it. Well, the other streamers here. <laughs> but yeah, other than that, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just happy to be here. So thanks for hosting this. Day. Thanks for taking the time to come around. Appreciate it. And last but not least, we got to take things slowly with him because he just got up. Blake Robinson in Down Under. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm the token Australian of the group. Uh, the thanks time. for having me. No, look, um, I, I'm Blake Robinson. Uh, I often re I, I release my music under the name Blakus. Um, and I mainly find myself in the trailer sort of world doing custom trailer stuff, particularly for electronic arts. Um, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to do a bunch of Star Wars trailers for them over the last couple of years. Um, and the Rise of Skywalker trailer as well. Uh, so, yeah, just, just trailers all over the place. Did, though, get to do something that wasn't a trailer recently, um, an Apex Legends short film, which was really fun as well with the Respawn nice. guys. But, yeah, good fun. Cool. <laughs> Thanks so much for being around and for getting up early. But, uh, I mean, you have a small kid, so <laughs> you're used to that anyway, right? Yeah, true, true, true. And, yeah, I made my five cents for that as well, or two, I don't know. Uh, Dirk Illet been streaming... Shortly after Alex and Daniel started with that a few years ago, uh, being on Twitch and YouTube all the time, pretty much sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on workload and everything. And um, yeah, appreciate you guys in the <coughs> chat room having you all here. Please leave your questions in the comments, depending on the topics we come up and talk about. Uh, what you want to know from the guys. I mean, we have everyone in one room. There's uh, rarely a better chance to direct your questions to that awesome roster of uh youtube <laughs> celebrities <laughs> <laughs> so uh absolutely appreciate you guys uh this whole conversation is is driven by what you want to hear from us so uh, appreciate any input there but 
to get started, I got a few questions through Facebook and also in a private message. And one of the things that uh, I get asked specifically about being a composer on YouTube or showcasing your workflow is pretty much the question, why do we actually do what we do? And I kind of yesterday thought about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> will this go on forever? Because I love this already. <laughs> That's one question in the chat. I uh, think we have an uh, ETA on this one, but I can tell you oh. right now what that will be. But anyway, question is, uh, why do we do what we do publicly on YouTube? Why do we share how we compose? Why why do we do this? So anyone wants to jump on that? I can kick off if you want. I remember why I started. So I started way back in the day, like I said, when we were doing the intro bit. I actually started, uh, it's a funny reason, because I'm, I'm sure most of you have experienced this before. You'll, you'll write a cue, you'll write a cue or, you know, an entire soundtrack. And like two months later, you'll listen to it and be like, how the fuck did I do that? You'll be like, I, I can't remember how I did that process, how I did any of this. So what I started doing was doing it as a way to remind myself, as, as documenting where my brain was at at the moment I was... Uh, you know, when I was writing that piece, because to me, I feel like when you're writing music, it's all about what's uh, like where your mindset is, you know? So if you need to write in a specific genre, you know, if you absorb that, just solely that type of music, the subconscious is more likely to call upon it when you're writing, you know, like w how we compose is like driving a car. You don't think about it. It just comes from within, you know, you just do it. And so the more you absorb. So what I was doing is I was documenting ways for me to uh, watch myself back and listening to the words and phrases I'm using when I'm explaining things as a, as a, almost like a, a back door to get my mind quickly back into that mindset. So if ever I need to do that thing again, I'm ready to do it because well, I've got a faster way to get into it rather than just having to sit for a week listening to dubstep or whatever it is you have to do for a client. You know? <laughs> but yeah, that's why I started. And then eventually people started watching it. And then I was like, oh, okay, you know, like people want to hear what I've got to say about, you know, people would comment like, oh, can you take a look at this, you know, sample library X? So I did. And then people started watching that. And then it sort of morphed from me remembering how to do stuff to me showing people. And the thing I, I, I learned very quickly is that you learn yourself very quickly when you have to show other people how to do it. So I, I just took it on board. I was like, this is just part of my own learning process. It's part of my own building process. I never got into it with the aim of like trying to get followers or do, do anything like that. It was just literally a way of me building myself. And, you know, it just sort of formed around, uh, formed around me. And, and so I still do it today. Um, mo still, still for my own self, you know, uh, aggrandization. I'm sure that's what people are thinking. But no, my, my self growth, you know, my just building myself up uh, in, in a non- uh, narcissistic way but it uh, but also at the same time sharing uh you know sharing that knowledge with other people and you know if i can help it's always good you know like i've had people and i think most of the people here have as well i've had people message them where they're like you know you've turned my career around you know i'm doing so much better every now you know since your video and that feeling does that does contribute to wanting to do it as well o obviously the ones where they're like you suck go fuck off you know like they're not so nice <laughs> they're not the ones that make you want to do it but the ones where they're like Hey, that was pretty good, bruv. You great, know, like great, great I'll, point I'll, I'll there. Those on. But yeah, that's L why I got into it. Yeah, anyway. Blake, how about you? Well, what made you go well, into it? Well, it's funny. Uh, listening to you talk, Daniel, I, I, I'm remembering back to about eight, maybe nine years ago now when I first started getting to this. It was <laughs> literally yours. One of your videos was one of the first ones that I saw when I typed in in YouTube. And I, I think, I can't remember, but it was something like, how to get your spiccato strings to sound like Hans Zimmer. I'm like, oh, yes, dude, there's a lot of that. Dude, I remember, the, I remember the trick. I think you've taken it off since then, but I'll tell everyone, just layer in some subtle tremolos. And, uh, just la uh, layer in some subtle tremolos underneath it or something like <laughs> oh, okay, that. I can't remember okay, exactly okay. how you We're going to have to draw a line uh, on that set here. <laughs> or I'll start doing the Australian. <laughs> 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 but I just remember that blowing my mind. And, and, and I think... Um, a lot, I, I, my profession before um, becoming a full-time composer about three or four years ago now was uh, teaching. And I taught little kids, you know, primary school kids, yeah. we call it over here, eight and nine-year-olds. And being able to do learning and stuff like that online, you know, like there's so many little tricks with mock-ups and, and samples and things like that that are just not really talked about. And and I, I learned everything that literally that I know off uh, no offense, but like crappy little YouTube videos like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, tell like, me and, what you really think, Blake. And so, <laughs> no offense, bro. No offense. No, I, I prefaced it. 
Um, and, and that's why, you know, and so it's a bit of a combination of that. The fact that I, I was able to learn so much is why I started dumping stuff out there as well. And it was kind of almost a little bit second nature to me coming from a teaching background as well. I just wanted to try, I, I love the transfer of information. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. Alex, can I tell you a story about that Spicato okay. video? Yeah, sure. Only if it's just quick, quickly. only if it's quick, mate. Only, only if it's quick, mate. No. So I put that video out there, right? You know, it was a VI control thing to show how to sound like Hans Zimmer strings. A few days later, I got an email from Hans Zimmer saying, <laughs> I think you'll find that's not how it's done. I didn't believe it was Hans Zimmer. So I emailed back, let me tell you why you're incorrect, sir. <laughs> I said this long, like, detail. That's email how it started. <laughs> as to why he was wrong. And it, then it, t it transpired it was actually hard. And I was like, ah. That's so funny. I like <laughs> it. No, and well, it is I think indeed I, not how you do them. So, but it is a legit is tip. It works. It's absolutely yeah. a legit tip. I remember that mm. video very much in my early days when when watching one one of uh, Daniel's early attempts. Definitely, on, on yeah. Videos, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Definitely, definitely worth it. But Alex, yes, yeah, the grandfather of of the yeah. uh, streamers. <clears throat> uh, what's your take? What uh, made you so go I actually. You know, back then I just had to check my YouTube account because I actually loaded, uploaded my first video in 2008. And I think I, wow. I did it like 2005 something and it was for a track called Herophobia, which was um, I remember that an track. official demo to Storm Drum 2. And the thing is, I hosted, I think, um, the, the, I mean, back then there was no social networks. There was no YouTube and, and Facebook and anything. So we just had forums, you know, we had like the medieval things of uh you know social networks so um i remember that that duck rogers just posted a demo on the on the sounds online website and then i received a lot of questions you know what did you do how did you get this track how did you write this track how do you compose all these percussions and this was you know the first idea i had of saying like where can i download you know some kind of a software where you can, can capture the screen of Cubase and just have the piano roll. And this was actually my first walkthrough video. So it basically consisted of, you know, you seeing the, the piano roll and I just had some, you know, whatever magic movie maker or something. Yeah. And I just basically put the, the, the patch names on top, what I used when you listen to that specific part. And that's it. That's, that's how I started it. And the response was really great. And so I thought, Hey, this is fun. And I'm one of these guys, I can't write music all the time. You know, if I just work for like a full week of mu music, or even if I wrote like three hours and one bit, I just have to do something else. I can't go on making music. And um, so this is a welcome, you know, exchange of, of, of you know, rebooting your brain or doing uh, something like this. So to do videos, to do the live stream thing. Well, it's still talking about music, but it's, you know, it's not composing right in this moment. So and yeah i'm still i had a little break actually for like through four or five years something and i kind of regret mm -hmm. i'm not keeping it consistent uh which is my main motto today you know like build build your channel consistently but dude i, I was mean, devastated back, like, when you left i was at genuinely devastated when you went away like oh, for real i watch your videos all the time man. <laughs> oh. yeah and these times we only can virtual hug anyone but Chris, yeah. what about you? You, <clears throat> as the baby boy, as you That's right. put it yourself, <laughs> what made you go into? Um, yeah, so I guess when, uh, like way back, I guess 20, 2011, so it's not as far back as some of you, but 2011, I started a piano channel. And <clears throat> that, I, I tried to remain consistent on that because I, I enjoyed, you know, playing and getting videos up on there. But after a while, um, piano performance wasn't like my favorite thing to do of all time. And then when I discovered songwriting and composing, I actually was much more interested in that type of thing. So then the end of 2018, I think I thought to myself, um, <clears throat> if I can create a channel about something I'm legitimately passionate about and want to continue doing, then I might have more success with um, motivating myself to actually creating regular content for that. So then the first thing I wanted to put on there was a piece I, the, the first orchestral piece I ever wrote. Um, so that went on there. And then after that, I kind of did a breakdown video for that piece. Um, <clears throat> and ever since the, the questions have just um, continued to come in and, and uh, I've, you know, I've grown with my audience. I've, I've continued to discover new techniques, learn from all of you guys and, and uh, just um, continue growing up as a, as a person who continues to, to create stuff. So it's been a lot of fun and 
um, have no plans on on stopping soon for sure. I think all of us want to continue making a some type of impact in in the industry, and you know, it's just a lot of fun along the way. So it's cool. a lot of fun so far. Well, it's great to to have you guys all all live nowadays and and see your videos. One question that goes along with that that um, someone asks is, is there an essential difference? And this is, I think, more a technical thing. Is there a major difference between doing a live stream or pre-made video, like like prepping everything and just uploading a video <coughs> that you have more time to create or the thrill of being live and anything can happen, so to say. Real. So uh, quickly, <laughs> so. Ma maybe jump into into that difference, if there's any for you and, and what do you, for example, prefer? Do you prefer to be live or do you prefer to do like sample review, library reviews or uh, track walkthrough, something like that to be done offline and then upload? What's your take on that? Daniel? I, I tell you what, it was a fucking blessing when live streaming came along because I hate with a passion doing pre-recorded videos because I'm always like, hey, guys. And, and then I'm like, hmm, was that good enough? You know, was that good enough? And then I'll like stop 10 minutes in and yeah. be like, fuck it, I'm going to start again. Hey, guys, Daniel J. Now, was that too powerful? Was that too on the note? You know, and so you practice live... under the shower, right? Dude, yeah. I practice everywhere. I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm surprised I'm not practicing on this. In, in fact, I just threw two practice Daniel James's out there. So anyway, as I was saying, <laughs> now um, when live streaming came along, it was, it's the, the the kind of person I am is definitely more suited to live streaming. Like I kind of I thrive on the. I'm not like extroverted in that way, but it's like when there's a live chat room and there's live people, I find it much easier to bounce ideas off of people than like on a forum or a message board. But even in like pre-recorded videos, you know, you feel like you're being a bit more canned, yeah. you know, a bit more kind of, uh, you're, you're watching what you say, you know, you're trying to be more articulate and stuff. And it, I tend to find uh, with me, you know, a lot of what my channel's about is is just me and my personality, the way I do things, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't do things the conventional way, not, not for effect. It's just that I, my channel's more for me than it is anything else. So that's just what it is. So when live streaming came along, it allows me to just be me. So when I'm doing reviews and uh, overviews and things like that, I'm, I feel like I'm more honest with it because it's, you know, because it's channeling through actually me rather than like uh, trying to, trying to impress people. Like I always found when I was pre-recording, I was trying to be like professional and all like proper. And it's like it, what I was doing, it's like I'm talking about recordings of someone tapping a, a glass in their living room. You know what I mean? I don't need to be <laughs> fucking professional about this. It's like no yeah. one really cares. People just care about what it sounds like. So I can instead just be myself and, you know, live. I, I feel like the live streaming allows me to express that considerably more than uh, a, a pre-record. And pre-records as well, worth saying pre-records also like if you say something bad in a review which i have been accused of saying before if you do a pre-record people will say that like oh you or, or you say something overwhelmingly good they'll be like you just edited out the bad bits or like you you know you're just you're only showing me the good bits or and, and shit like that and when you do it live it's like dude it's eight hours long sit down grab a coffee go watch it and all <laughs> shut the fuck up you know like it's <laughs> that might be another <laughs> question i got a question actually do the streams need to be this long <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean, you mentioned something that I find pretty interesting. I think one of the major difference between like a pre-recorded video and going live is actually you kind of need a little bit of an extrovert personality persona to be able to jump in front of a camera and interact with an audience live, no matter if it's on an actual stage with audience in front of you or if it's through a camera with the audience sitting behind their screens. It's still, there is a kind of thrilling element of being alive and uh, anything can happen. If you throw um, up, you throw up, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And uh, so if someone asks me what the difference or what is better, I think that's the main difference because I think not everyone is suited for going live or doing live streams yeah. just because yeah, of sure. maybe not as extrovert persona, personality. Um, on the other hand... Um, It's, I think that going live is a great way of building more of an audience than uploading a pre-made video and only have communication through the, through the, for example, through the comments on the video or something like that. Uh, so I think that the interactive part of a live stream is uh, more helpful in building a community or building a communication platform for, for the stuff that you're talking about. So that's, that's my take on it. Blake, what do you think? Did you ever do pre-made yeah, ones? Uh 
I, I've neglected my my few followers for a couple of years now. So apologies to any of you out there. So, uh, but I yeah, love the, the live stream, the interaction side of it's the the main reason why I chose to go live. I did a couple of things, um, really long live ones. You know, just r raw. <laughs> I think they appeal to different people as well. I mean, people who. Um, you know, the pre-made short punchy videos are, are, are helpful for people just out there trying to get, you know, specific facts and information and all that. But yeah, the lives are a bit more fun for people who want to actually, you know, have a bit of a journey with you and, and a bit of fun. So, yeah. I suppose if we're being honest with it as well, like no one wants to say it, but there's a degree of wanting a little bit of fame out of it as well, isn't there, boys? Like we're not doing this for no one to watch it, are we? <laughs> like... We, those views do matter to a degree. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe we've we've all become addicted to the endorphins of getting likes and views. Does anyone else feel that sometimes? <laughs> well, I just like, think the, the nature of the being a content doing creator. So well? just the nature of being a content creator in general. Like as as a producer of something, you want to have your work yes. recognized in some degree, right? An artist, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No one yeah. makes art to be put in a cupboard. Right. Yeah. I just looked at my first <laughs> YouTube upload, uh, and it was definitely me just posting a mock up basically trying to say, and you don't do that for any other reason than for people to hear it <laughs> right right exactly <laughs> right uh so any any other notices on on live versus pre-made alex i think you didn't say anything about that and you did I both think i know that for sure <laughs> <laughs> I pretty much agree with Daniel because you know you it's the interaction the thrill you know you have your life on camera and i mean there is like this 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 constant brain fart plug in 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 a german's brain especially when you talk in english because you always have to translate first before you you know get it out and then i'm one of these guys who sometimes gets into that you know kind of that grandfather on the on the muppet show just going on stage and then where where are you guys you know oh it's this way you know so you really have to think first what you're trying to say and then you get into some route you think through in german and then you're heading out in Ger in, in english and this is kind of a kind of a kind of a challenge and this is the uh the thrilling uh, when you go live and you interact with people and everybody sees you and what's important for me why i did go live is that everybody also sees you failing because i totally suck on playing piano you know i'm just i totally fail i can you know just ask me to play like some kind of a track i can't but this is also what I want people to see because on YouTube you. videos, it's like everybody's like, <laughs> you know, I'm just. <laughs> oh, the one one what's, what's wrong with Everybody, that, Alex? You, <laughs> what's wrong with <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that's what DJ does. Yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with that? We talk about. <laughs> what's the problem? <laughs> the disco moves. We bring them in. Uh, there was, can, I, what, can I just make another point? Sorry, oh, between yeah, sure. the, between the live. <laughs> I, I I genuinely believe that once you get live stream set up, which it can be complicated at first, but once it's set up, it's considerably easier that, yeah. to live stream than to do a video yes. for yeah, YouTube. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. I can just put the camera on, push record, and it's beamed out to everyone there's a chat room already done for me and when it's done it's put in an archive and then i can choose if i can be bothered to go cut it up deal with it see if there's anything decent for youtube you know like oh. whereas if you do a youtube video you have to set up the camera you have to record it you have to make sure you actually recorded it has anybody done that one not actually push the record button that fucking sucks <laughs> anyway but like More you have to record it and then you have to uh, sync the audio together, then you have to edit it together, you know, cut out all the bits. Some cameras only let you record for 30 minutes at a time. For someone like me, you can imagine that's a bit of a problem, right? And then so you edit it all together and then you have to export it, which takes fucking hours if you're doing it in 4K. Then you have to upload it, which takes another few. You know what I mean? It's just much yeah. easier to just go stream. I'm done, you know? That's that's my effort for the day. <laughs> cool. Um, going on, there was a great question in the chat room uh, regarding uh, myself and Daniel being in LA now, having moved from good old Europe over here, and Alex staying in Germany, Blake in Australia, and Chris, I think you're in Canada, right? I'm in Canada. Uh, yeah. So the question was, how much that had an influence on on the career being in LA, or even other way around not being in LA how much of that has an influence on on your career so maybe that's a quick thing to talk about um Daniel you being in LA did you feel that make made a major difference your move um to be honest to be honest like I did I I did all all of my dream projects you know I did them in in battle with the little village just outside Hastings you know it's a little quaint village so I didn't need to be in LA to do the things I wanted uh but I heard it put really well by someone it's like uh you i think it might have been dean ogden i heard it from but it's like you don't get 
you don't get points for being in LA, but you do get points taken away for not being here. And by that it means no one's going to give you anything just because you're in LA, but there are opportunities you might miss because yeah. you're not here. Right. So it's like, it's an opportunity. It's, it's an opportunity more than it is like a, a, a thing that's guaranteed. So moving here, like puts you in a position to get lucky more often because you know, there's more directors here. There's a chance you go down to Trader Joe's and you're both going for the same crumpets. Boom. Director, you know, you've met someone that's not going to happen in battle. You know, it's going to be me and Ethel fighting over the last eggs. You know, it's not, it's not the same kind of <laughs> balance. So just being here, you know, you're amongst the famous people. You're amongst the creatives. You're amongst the artists, the singers. So if that is, if that's the world you're in, it helps to be here. You know, you don't have to be here. Like I said, I did everything I wanted to already before I got here. Um, now I'm just kind of, my wife's a trade commissioner for Finland in Los Angeles. So now I'm more here for her than I need to be here. You know what I mean? Because still like, most of the work I'm getting is coming from like other parts of America or like I just did a bunch of Chinese projects, you know, like <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like that myth of you have to be in LA has kind of gone in the internet, uh, in the internet age, you know, with people being able to work over the internet. However, that human connection thing does still exist. So again, you don't get any points for being here. You don't get given anything for being here, but you get more, there's more chance you'll have opportunity here if you happen to be here, just just proximity. Because <laughs> physically being here, it would right. make that, it that's, more That's you know, pretty much likely. my experience as well. Like like uh, coming from a village south of Berlin, 40 kilometers outside of the city, which was like a 250 people village, uh, you don't have much possibilities of meeting someone else working in the industry even when you told someone uh, your professional musician or composer anyone asks you no i mean what do you do to earn a living so <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that is kind of out of the question in these rural areas outside and coming to la uh, it felt way more normal being in this industry because everyone else is too so you're part you're just a part of something bigger not the special strange guy that is doing something in Hollywood. Hollywood or whatever mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah in this in today's age of being interconnected globally um, I it, mean look it, at us look at us look, look how spread out we are look Blake had the poor old Blake had to get up at seven in the morning to make this happen you know what I mean like that's uh, yeah that's right. the genius of the internet that's why you don't need it <laughs> right. as much we, which still, look at the poor boy which still on the other hand I mean there are moments when uh, Let's be honest, there are certain types of job that don't happen if you're not in the city. I had the yeah, same thing. I, I, I worked with the trailer house and I couldn't have worked on that trailer, even if the pitch didn't work out in the end. But I couldn't have done it if I wouldn't have actually entered, physically entered their door, signed the NDA mm. and sitting down with the trailer mm. editor and talk about mm. what they need. So because they have no way of sending anything out into the world. Uh, so, so if you're not here, that's an opportunity you are going to miss out if you're not around. So that's, that's also considering like your security. personality though, right? Because naturally, if you want these opportunities, you have to be willing to actually go out and get them. Because you could live in LA, you could live in a very widely populated area, but if you're just an introvert, you don't want to go out and get those yeah. opportunities, then what's the point, right? Um, yeah, like correct. for me, for example, I'm like, I'm in Canada, I'm in the most like rural area of Canada you can be. Um, so I, I basically had no choice but to go online and a hundred percent of my opportunities came because of my YouTube channel. And I'm like very thankful for that. So it gives me more of a motivation to stay connected and go on Facebook, go on all these outlets that actually keep you connected with different people um, because you're not going to get that around where I'm living. So it's like, it, it's, it's also helps me socially as well, you know, being exposed to just more people and doing streams like this, it's just very helpful to, you know, um, be in the presence of other people and um, build yourself up that way too. Yeah, right. Alex, what do you think? Just, Does it hinder you being uh, in good old Germany instead of in the center of it all? <laughs> well, it was, you know, I had this uh, experience when I was in, in Los Angeles 2012 for the incredible Two Steps from Hell concert in the Disney Hall. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, I, you know, visited a few people, let's so to say, and I experienced the situation that I met some guy who I work with, who is also um, part of a famous heavy metal band. <laughs> so, and I was in, uh, visiting in his house and then he said, hey, we have the chance to work together on a movie. And, um, you know, when I got back and we, we had a few Skype sessions and then suddenly he said, you know, unfortunately you can't work on this because the producer wanted 
both of the composers to be in LA. And this was one of these points where I thought, you know, shit, it would have been cool to be over there, to live over there. But then again, I had this uh, experience that I worked with another Hollywood composer on a small, it was just a small movie, um, but it was, hey, it was a Hollywood movie, but just did some additional arrangements for that. And um, I did it from Hamburg, you know, so it works. So I don't regret it. And I mean, I, w I wrote music for Epic Score. I wrote music for Two Steps from Hell, um, all these companies, Liquid Cinema, and they all based more or less in, um, in LA. So it works. You can sit in Hamburg, you know, which is also not just a small, you know, town. It, it's a really great city. I don't want to live anywhere else. This was also one big factor that I realized I can get this work, you know, I get this work done from Hamburg and I can live in the mon one of the most beautiful cities uh, on the entire planet. Um, even if it's not true, I think, <laughs> but you know, so you don't need to be in Los Angeles. Definitely not. Yeah. I always used to say, as long as I have a laptop and an internet connection, I can pretty much work from anywhere. So yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. so something that goes along with that as well, like the whole stage of the industry being in LA and uh, a lot of questions or a question that comes up every now and then is um, how do you actually get into the whole process of a working composer? What's, what's the best way to, I mean, if, if there were a golden recipe, I would have written a book about it and be rich on an island somewhere. So obviously we know that there is no golden recipe, but um, since we have that panel of being on YouTube and bringing your own brand out there, and I consider my, my YouTube channel or, or the live streams and everything is also a type of branding and brand identity and, and getting your own uh, ability out there. I mean, how many of you guys uh, created jobs through your YouTube channel? I definitely did. So I know for sure yeah, that two of my biggest projects sure. came through my YouTube streams. Um, so that's how I got all my work. Uh, and it, this touches on the last point a little bit too, where, and for anyone out there watching who lives in like the middle of nowhere, like me and Chris or whoever else, uh, there is, while there is, are a lot of jobs that you can only get in LA, there are so many jobs that you can get living anywhere. And so it doesn't matter where you live. Right. If, if you can them. do the There's job. There's way more but, of them. Yeah, all, all the, yeah exactly. <laughs> the, the only thing people care about really is whether you can do the job. And if you can do it from a little tin shed in the outback, then that's good enough, mate. So, um, and, and they don't care. So, and the YouTube um, shows that. The YouTube shows that you know absolutely. how to do it. That's the point, isn't it? And and I encourage people to put stuff out on YouTube and SoundCloud. Um, and I mean, how are people going to hear it if you don't? And, and, and my philosophy yeah. was always, all right, I'm going to make some music. I'm going to chuck it on the internet. If it's good enough, people will probably come to me for work. I, I, and and it, I'll, I guess I'm, I've been a bit lucky. All my opportunities came from messages on SoundCloud in the beginning from publishers. And then... Um, yeah, same same on YouTube, which then led to you know people contacting my website um, for further work, and then and then you build relationships, and then most of my work now comes from my relationships with you know people at Electronic Arts and and you know and all, all these other places as well. Um, but I still get new opportunities just from the stuff that's hanging around on SoundCloud that I uploaded five years mm. ago. You know, like it, it's it's so worth mentioning. It's oh, sorry, I was, no, gonna, no, I was just going to say it's it's worth mentioning. Um, Oh, I completely forgot what I was going to say then. <laughs> Carry on. No. <laughs> okay, no. There we go. No. Oh, Daniel it's, it's James. Like it, only one. I, I like, let it go because I thought I'd interrupted him. So I was like, oh, no, actually, no. go on. You go. I'm and done, mate. It just went. It just disappeared. That was so fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can, I can speak from that perspective. Um, I'm, I like Blake here. Um, like I said, I got 100% of my work from YouTube. And I think for me, the most important thing or for any like content creator or person looking for work as a composer is to have some sort of presentable portfolio. And when that opportunity does come in, you have to be able to be contacted easily. Uh, there are so many cases where like people are advertising their work and then I kind of check out, you know, you know, contact me here and either the links are not working or their profiles on some network are just down or something. And then that person just loses their prospect just like that. So it's like, having a portfolio, having some a body of work that you can present, um, being e also being like a people person, you, you just learn to work with people. It's, it's just uh, something you just get with experience, I guess. 
You reminded and... me what I was going to say. Sorry. Did I? Okay. <laughs> You're next. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, and just and just being easy to contact and and then and also over delivering. I think that's that's kind of the key thing. Like when you're working with somebody, um, uh, for the most part, it's not enough just to do the work and then just say, okay, I'm finished. Um, it's always better to kind of go a little bit extra and say, like, is there is there anything else I can do for you, or for the next yeah. time, maybe I can help you do this. Uh, as part of our deal or something, you know. So you just want to make it um, kind of like a customer experience as as pleasant as possible. I think that really contributes to repeat clients as well. Yeah. Sorry. The thing. The thing I was going to say is, and, and it's ironic enough, it's that like the thing with YouTube and videos and streams and as well is that your your personality translates. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know that was a yeah, funny thing to forget. 100%. No, an old narcissistic me, but anyway, <laughs> it's like it translates in a way that like a cold call or an email or a SoundCloud link won't. You know what I mean? And and this is a personality driven industry, and by that I mean like it's like like it's already been mentioned. It's like interconnected networks and connections and friends of people. And sometimes you know sometimes people just have a personality that doesn't meet that kind of personality of that team or that group. You know, like that people think and feel in different ways. And, you know, when you put your yourself out in videos and live streams and stuff, who you are translates and comes across. And so, like, I've definitely had work that people have been like, nothing you've done is like exactly what we're looking for, but, like, you seem like you know what you're talking about and the kind of person we'd get on, you know, and we'd go, go out for a drink or whatever and, and realize we'd get on, and then we'll try and figure it out together. So, like, they, you know, I've had people come to me even, you know, not hearing if I can do it or not simply because of the personality. And that's not, that's not me being like, I've got a great personality. It's just that it, my <clears> personality <throat> exists uh, uh, like in a quantifiable fashion. Like people can go watch videos and then be like, that's the kind of person that person is. And they'll know whether or not they like that or dislike that. And that's, that's fine, you know, because there is enough people on both sides. You know, there's going to be enough people that like me and enough people that hate me in the world for every yeah, what, one of us. You know what I mean? So it could be in yourself. Sorry, but I remember that in your streams, Daniel, that somebody complained that you curse a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it? I mean, Sorry. if somebody was like you, then just switch off, you know, because yes. that's your personality and that's how you handle things. And yes. Um, cool. I couldn't stop it if I tried, Alex. I couldn't stop it if I tried. <laughs> there we go. Uh, by the way, I forgot the parental advisory <laughs> in the beginning of the stream. Um, oh, frick. <clears throat> But anyway, I have to look. There was a great question that I really liked that I, uh, I think uh, Valhalla, no, Halvala <laughs> asked that. Um, I, I love the idea. Uh, what is the one piece of advice that you would give yourself from five or ten years ago? Can I answer that? Yeah, sure. Because it also relates to the question before. <clears throat> I think my entire career is based, I mean, Back then, as I said before, we didn't have uh, Facebook and social networks in general. So it was like forums. But my entire career, actually anything I do, maybe working for Dynamedion for uh, Germany's biggest music video game, you know, music company. And um, or getting into the trailer industry and everything. There was just my, my, my entire career is based just on being around on forums, being around on social networks. This is how everything started. So if I would go back to myself and saying, what would you change? I would say, first of all, nothing except one fact to build content consistently, regularly. This is the best thing you can do. And this is, um, I don't mean this in a negative way, like pointing to everyone watching this. This is why 90% of you will fail because you're not building content Jeez. consistently regularly you know ouch <laughs> you're gonna fail fuckers <laughs> i think the message Quick i think now. you know how they 90 percent of you are gonna fail <laughs> <laughs> sorry no I, i didn't mean to break your flow that just cracked me up sorry no yeah i mean just i'm i mean i mean the people who know me uh know probably <laughs> how i mean this but you know i'm just saying this kind of a uh. motivational message that 90 will fa uh, fail because then they would feel motivated to mm, yeah. stay, you know, stay in Absolutely. that wheel and, and producing content. Yeah, yeah. And um, at least this is how I get, you know, if somebody like really kicks my ass, I just, this is where I start working. When somebody puts something negative on me, this is where I fire up and just go and make it better. You know, this is the stuff that drives me. Uh, not, not necessarily insulting, but, you know, just kicking me. And um, yeah, so I would just go for building this content consistently. And as you can see, You know, with all of you guys, with all of you brilliant guys, 
uh, in this round, you you just more or less did it regularly. I mean, I know Christopher, you did like a challenge recently where you did put out yeah uh, a video. I did a daily, video a day right? for uh, I think it was March. Yeah, yeah. Was how, did, how, how did that go? It went very well, actually. I think my traffic actually tripled or something. It, it was it was actually yeah, it was very productive. And it, it was a lot of fun because I think ever since I started uploading since 2018, I've been able to put out at least one video per week. So it, it's just it was another boost to just keep on going. Yeah. But yeah. by the way, I, I uh, someone uh, <laughs> just mentioned that I shall not forget to tell my opinion on things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm please. I'm just a, I'm just the moderator. <laughs> I don't have any opinion. Uh, on no, <laughs> um, take control. I'm just I'm just hosting this whole thing. No, but, but what I wanted to say regarding the the YouTube stuff, uh, what made you? I, I didn't answer what made me go into it. For the first of all, it was Alex yeah. and Daniel watching their videos, <laughs> and but the main thing for me was um, when I started doing videos, it was indeed a sense of like giving a little bit back because. I, I wanted to do the stuff that I was looking for and didn't find. So that was one of the things. So when I started out, a lot of that stuff was just non-existent, uh, or at least I didn't know what to look for. And um, over the years, I got a lot of questions. How can you share secrets or anything like that, which I don't really care at all about, because obviously uh, I just want to, to state that from the get-go, if you do a complete track walkthrough with the decisions, what sample libraries you use and what EQ settings you do, of course someone out there could completely copycat that and get that same track done. But that's it. They do. What happens? What happens on the next stage? So the next track that I write has nothing to yeah. do with whatever anyone can can copy. You don't. Yeah. You cannot give away your own creativity. And if I help someone along the right. way with with giving away these. I don't see them as secrets, but giving away these uh, workflows or tips. Techniques. Uh, if, if, Techniques, if, yeah. Yeah, it receipts. So that's a, um, a way of saying it. And um, t if I give away, then help someone building their own voice and their own career out of it, I actually rather feel grateful than being threatened by the fact that I might educate another composer that can take my job or whatever. Yeah. That's that's not going to They're coming happen. for your job, Dirk. They're coming for your job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, so so I just want to say one of the reasons to get into this was the sense of giving back to to uh, I love educating as well like like Blake said uh it's it's something that I just enjoy. Um and honestly I mean, so someone recently complained about one of my videos why there's uh, like four uh, commercials in the first 20 minutes. I didn't even know it was that much. So I needed, to, <laughs> I needed to change my settings. But obviously, I mean, if you have a certain threshold, if a certain view count, like 10,000 subscribers, it's not like you get freaking rich of it. But if you can pay your, your power bill with that, that's fine. You know, and uh, so so I'm not in it for the money, but I also do not throw money away. So if I can make some bucks from that, of course I do. That's, uh, in my opinion, that's totally fine. Um, because it's still, a, I hate to say it like that, but it's still a lot of work that we put into that. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not only like, uh, here, go have it all. Um of course, I expect a little bit of a return if I share something, not in terms of that I want to get paid for it. But uh, we all have our PayPal buttons on the website or something like that asking for support. Oh, yeah, or I'm we, a whore. Uh, or we have I'm the, a whore. Or we have the, I'm for sale. The, 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 <laughs> there <laughs> yeah, is a right, PayPal. Right. So we have the Twitch button that people can apply. We set up a Patreon page to, to ask for support because we all are in it to make a living from that. So uh, I think people wow. also need to understand that that as as much fun and game that is, and uh, we're chatting around, we're still making a living from that. It is our job mm. to create, and mm. uh, obviously we kind of can expect a little bit of a return. That can that not necessarily has to be all in monetary terms. Uh, it can also be the recognition uh, i mean we mentioned that in the beginning every like that comes in you do it for the adrenaline that you have when you put up a video when you have interaction with the uh, with the audience and you get a like and someone just asked what was the meanest comment you ever got on your video <laughs> what made you think how why, what made you put together these words i think that's the other side of thing i mean in this day and age we have to do with trolls and um 
all these guys that uh, are just envious of what you do. I thought you meant Foleman for a second. No, that's not troll. It's troll. No, did I pronounce that wrong? Is troll? I was like, what? No, no, no. Sorry, it's just my. That's where my brain went. I was like, troll. Same here. Yeah. No, we're not talking about trolls. Trolls. Carry on. Talking about internet trolls. So I mean, that's the other side of things. If if you put yourself out there, you make yourself. You you build a platform for anyone be it positive or negative so both can happen i mean maybe you jump on that what, what do you guys say what was the worst experience you had with a comment on on one of your videos or something like that what made you cringe mm. there's been too many <laughs> man i've been i've been shat on so often from so many directions from so many people uh, by this point they all just kind of blur into this big you just build a resistance shit. Yeah, it's just a wall of shit. I don't, I don't pay credence to it anymore. I, I heard a phrase, and I, I can't remember who said it, but it, I, I live by it now. It's uh, don't, don't take to heart criticism from someone you wouldn't turn to for advice. Ooh. And so, if someone's going to criticize you, if you wouldn't have listened, if you wouldn't turn to them for advice in the first place, why does it fucking matter if they tell you to go suck a dick because you don't like Spitfire? You know, <laughs> it's like, mm. what is life? What is the point of, of leaving a message like that? But anyway, you just can't let it get to you. You just got to kind of move on with it, you know? Like, so, like, I honestly, right now, can't remember any of the negative ones because I don't care about them anymore. I genuinely do not care. Like, if, if someone just is, is intentionally doing that, I just block it. I just block it. Like, there's, like, people say freedom of speech. It's like, I don't care. It's like, it's, they're, they're contributing nothing positive. You know, why are they here in the first place? It's something different just... when it's constructive, right? Yeah. Of oh, well, yeah. If they're saying yeah. that, yeah. like, this is bad because this, this, and this, and you could improve. I mean, obviously not being a cunt about it, but like, you know, <laughs> coming across and just, just saying it nicely or whatever. Right. I, I love, Absolutely. I love if, if someone comes in and goes, you suck. It's like, and goodbye. Yeah. I love <laughs> you know, what Tom right. Hart just said in the chat. Uh, he said like something, uh, once you're at the point that you get negative comments on your videos, you do something right because you have something worth mentioning. <laughs> so. Oh, that, that's a Churchill quote, isn't it? It's like, you've got enemies, good. It means you've stood up for something in your life. Yeah, right. I so have, um, I've, goes along I've run across, way. sorry, I've run across um, whole forum posts uh, of, of um, like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages of people bashing my music on the Star Wars Sorry. trailers. Sorry, what? I was having a bad day. Um, <laughs> but I love it. I actually love it. It doesn't bother me at all. I read it and got nice. some popcorn and, and it was, you know what I mean? Like people will always criticize you um, no matter what you do. And and what DJ said is yeah. is true. You got to choose who you listen to um, and whether you value what they say or not. And and I I actually understood the position what a lot where a lot of people were coming from you know like what I what I do with the Star Wars music in the trailers is a bit sacrilege to the traditional John Williams thing do you know what I mean I'm actually simplifying it I'm stripping it out of all the John How Williams and I'm making it a pop track basically do you know what I mean you. I know I'm doing that but it's what the people want <laughs> <How dare laughs> it's what the it's what my clients want and um so yeah I, it's I think I think you've got to have a thick skin with that kind of thing and I think people who are triggered easily by trolls. <laughs> I want to refocus their energies on actually getting better at their music. Cool. That's a Definitely. I think one thing, you have to convert it into that most of the time when somebody's criticizing you in a negative way or just insulting you, not criticizing, but insulting you, it's most of the time that... So, or, or let, him, let me put it different. Sometimes I get into a conversation with these guys And then you realize that they had a bad day, you know, like literally I had a bad day. So it's like <laughs> they, they had a problem, something what ha was happening during the day. They woke up and stepped into dog shit or whatever, and this automatically shaped their day. And then they stumble upon an email from me and saying, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time. So I'm like, bah, 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 bah. Or some YouTube comment when they just, or like uh, Blake said, you know, they, they were um, you know, bashing his music. These are probably yeah. people who are either, uh, how do you say, envious um, mm -hmm. by not having the opportunity on cre uh, writing music for a Star Wars trailer. I mean, Star Wars, yeah. It's freaking that, that's huge. The thing. You can track. That's, you can track that's how. An awesome how job. Oh, I was gonna say you could track like how. How, like the progression of your career and how well you're doing by how much people objectify you when they talk about you on forums and stuff. Like, so I noticed when I got, you know, removed from a certain forum, like <laughs> pe 
People stop talking <laughs> about you like a human being. They talk about you like an object. And I've noticed that I get that in my YouTube comments. I get that in Twitter now. Oh, no. You know what I mean? So you put something up and then people don't talk about you as though you're even there. Oh. You know what I mean? It's like, I disagree with this thing or I disagree with that thing. Or, or this guy, you know, he, he sucks because of this. And it's like it's completely irrelevant to what you're talking about. But you can usually tell, like, if you're doing right by the less humanized you are when people talk about you. If they talk about you more of like a thing, then you, yeah. you're doing good. Then they consider you a legitimate thing. Like and that's they the thing. If they're talking you. about you as a, Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you get beyond the point of them talking about you as a person, you are important enough in their life that they have objectified you to a, a thing that they discuss, you know, like they compensate a, a, like, their own personal problems. Probably. Yeah. You, you are a topic in their mind, yeah. you know, like you're not even a human anymore. You are a, an, an agenda. You are a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, any negative experience on your end so far? Um, yeah. Well, my channel is small enough that I can actually go onto my comments page and literally hide user from channel that are, that get too extreme. So I've had a few instances of those for sure. And um, it's just like for myself, mental health. Like I'm not at the point where I, I, I can just block it out and move on just yet. Uh, it's I, like, I'm just naturally, a, I think a sensitive person. <laughs> so it, it, it does, it does get to you sometimes, of course, but I mean, you're Canadian, so anyone can, there you go. It. See, that's the explanation there. There is the, there is the reason. You rather that's apologize for having a video out the there comments. that offended, offended someone. I'm sorry. That's, that's how it works. Yeah, the comments are like, Chris, you suck. And you're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry for putting my video up in the funny I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, okay, there was a quiz. I think we are moving on a little bit more to the tech side of things, of not necessarily YouTube related, but being composer related. So a lot of questions. And I got that before the stream as well. And two guys asked that now as well. Uh, pretty much the approach: template versus no template when creating new music. Uh, what do you think is the if there is any better approach or why do you choose uh, to work with a template or to choose not to work with a template? Uh, maybe you start with Chris on this one. Oh, wait, sure. who, how many of you actually use templates? Well, I'm, yeah, Raise I, your I hand. Guilty. <laughs> who doesn't My, use that a template? That, maybe it's a better question. That is a multi-layered answer. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, well, when I look at your streams, Daniel, I... I'm, I'm confused because uh -oh. it looks kind of like a template, but then it's kind of not a template as it well. Looks like so a template, I'm intrigued about what you're talking about. Well, what is it? <laughs> it's content. <laughs> I look at your stream and what is this? It looks like a template, but it ain't a template. <laughs> no, no. It, it, okay. So I use the template <laughs> for my orchestra because I nerd out on the orchestra heaps. Like I've literally yeah. spent years just tweaking the like the 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 imaging and the and the and the reverb and the eqs on my orchestra and i update it all the time and so my orchestra is a thing right it's its own thing and so i have a, i very much have a specific template for that um and then everything else is kind of fair game for me so i kind of yeah. just every other project that needs you know different synths and different other sound design and, and stuff like that you know, there's no way for me to really template that effectively yeah, yeah. i'm interested on your thoughts on this everyone else especially you daniel <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, so, so my one, my template's empty, right? So it, it looks like a template, See, I agree. is that a template? Let me, ex no, let me explain myself, <laughs> like, let me explain myself. I've got a whole thing lined up. Don't make me forget it again. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go. <laughs> right, so, so, no, my template is, is basically, it looks like a template. So I have a section for strings, brass, percussion, all, you know, all the sections. Mm. But they're, they're basically just a folder with empty MIDI channels pointed to a singular instrument track of contact that's empty. Right. And the reason I do that is when I get into a project, I don't want to just rely on what I've already loaded up because I know mm. that given the opportunity, humans are lazy creatures. So if I load up instruments, I'm going to use the instruments I've loaded. So with nothing loaded, I have to use my brain. I have to think, okay, what do I actually want it to do? What do I want it to sound like? Because I'm going to have to load a string anyway. Might as well load one that's perfect for what I'm doing. Right. So I do that and I, you know, and, and that's how I, I fill up that empty template. But then if I'm going, like if I'm in a project or something, uh, if I'm doing like a movie or a video game, like on uh, Man Eater that I just finished, like the first day or first week I, I spent making like the tracks which define it. And then I saved those as templates. So I was you, like, it's almost like that kind of, uh, like the sweet concept, you know, like writing ideas and then using the thing. So I have my empty template 
I, I think about the project, I, I load the best things for it, and then I save that as the project template, and then I'll use that for the project rather than just using like a set orchestral template for the, you know, for everything. So yet, like I don't have a template loaded all the time, but I basically create one every time. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> actually just someone just wrote here, it's, it's almost like, so it's, someone's just wrote, is that a template or a shell? I like that. Yours is more like a shell. Hey, yeah, like you mine's constructed a shell. A shell that exactly. You then I like that word. Yeah, David it's a prepped, it's, it's yeah. a prepped, empty template, ready yeah, to on, go. Yeah, on my end, so so I was working for years with my big template with like pretty much two thousand MIDI tracks all on two slave machines and everything, um, which uh, allowed me because I knew it or I know it inside out, I can write very fast with it. So when I know I have a bunch of production music tracks to do, uh, do like tension tracks or whatever, where I need my brass, my strings, and all that good stuff, uh, I can fire it up and I can write three cues in a day that's no no issue there so and i don't Heresy. think about loading sounds or what sounds i need i just click the corresponding channels and just keep on writing and it's all pre-mixed all done so i pretty much just export afterwards i'm done so that's for the fast approach uh, recently i came to find that uh, so i'm a cubase by the by the way uh, just just on a side note what we guys at i think most of us are cubase so you're logic chris right i'm logic yeah Blake Cubase, Dan Cubase. Cubase. I, I'm a newly converted garage band user. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Mean, yeah, so, but yeah, I, I recently realized that uh, the downside of having that huge blown up template is that Cubase can get a little bit laggy uh, overall in terms of performance. Not Cubase necessarily, but rather my system. Although I'm actually on the latest i9 processor. Need, but you, get, need you get yourself a better computer there, Doc. Can't <laughs> be yeah, going fine, Dirk. Your computer there you problems. Go. There you bit go. rude. And, um, <laughs> and so, but, but one of the main reasons why I switched, and actually, Daniel, you you kind of uh, pushed me into that realm. So I had that shell approach now as well. Uh, where, Wait, what? Did, what did, I, did, I didn't push him. I didn't touch him. Uh, what, what did I do? <laughs> Especially in these days. No, no, no physical contact. Uh, but, oh, okay. But uh, yeah, I got the, I love the idea of having these shells and uh, I just took it a little bit further for, for my uh, approach of, of having everything pre-routed and having all the group settings done. Mm. Uh, so what I have when I open my contact now, I have cr pretty much six empty uh, 16 empty instruments sitting there, like violin one, violin two, violola, cello. So when I load from the quick load menu, and I actually love the contact quick load menu, I completely got rid of the library panel view because I hate scrolling all the way down. Uh, to look for a sound and the quick load is actually amazing for that because right click and uh, I just created all these uh, empty instruments within that contact instance to know where I need to put the cello when I load it because then I know that mm. it's already routed to its cello group etc where I have all the other stuff uh, sitting um, and this actually forced me to like you mentioned Daniel uh, when, when starting on a track not relying on all the sounds that are preloaded and kind of running into the danger of sounding the same every time uh, yep. you write something but rather think about before loading a sound okay do i want to go with cinematic studio strings do i actually want to have some spitfire sounds there do i want to go with um whatever string library i have at hand and rather can i give you a tip doc can i give you a quick tip yeah so you know don't use the quick well. load <laughs> <laughs> what what yeah let, let me give you a spitfire tip no the, the quick the quick load uh thing you know how you said you close the library tab what like i do the similar thing to you like i have them in the quick load you know for when i know that i need them but what i like to do is i like to just move around in that library tab libraries that i haven't used for ages and i'll just put them at the top so then like i look at it and i'm like oh i could give that a go and it just makes mm. you think in a completely different way because we have so many samples that we just don't use right that's still decent because at the end of the day they're just sounds you know what i mean just because they were recorded 10 years ago yeah it's like you it's have different sound, colors colors in the sound. shelf that you choose to to paint exactly your picture. So the, the library tab for me is like the inspiration tab. So whenever you see me stream, you'll always see like Mysteria and Thrill and things that just make my brain go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And then I'll always load the things I'm looking Like if I go, oh, I need this, I'll usually go to the quick load because I know where it is. In your, like, in your decision, are you more driven by the graphics of the library? Is that what inspires you? Oh, I, I am a, I'm a fucking magpie. If something's shiny, I'll just <laughs> gravitate towards it. I'll be like, I, I don't care if it sounds shit. We're putting Mysteria in, you know. <laughs> that Mysteria doesn't sound shit, by the way just so we're clear on that yeah, and by right, the way right. i don't actually use i don't actually use garage band i just want to be clear for anyone <laughs> watching this on youtube buds any potential all the clients, kiddos running out YouTube. now grabbing garage one from the apple store uh, yeah. <laughs> oh god yeah so anyway. uh but yeah i 
wanted to to finish that the the big template i still use it when i need to work fast and know that this is exactly the sounds that i'm using for for what i'm going to do but i do love the freedom that that empty shell template approach gives me in in exploring not new sounds because i still have them already but i forgot about them that i have the same as you Mm. like when you scroll through the library panel and what i did i just have uh the same grouping that I have in my overall uh, template, like strings, brass, woodwinds, etc. I have the same groups in my quick load now. And if I click on strings, then I have uh, all developers like Heaviosity, Spitfire, or AD, or whatever. Uh, and that, just the fact alone to build this quick load, this is the painful process to, to build your quick load menu because that takes some time because you need to sift through all your libraries and, and drag them in manually. But that actually helped me to realize what kind of shit I actually have because uh, the, once I got to the to the drives that are not SSDs but HEDs <laughs> then you realize mm. oh I have shit ton of stuff Getting lying there that the I Giga haven't Studio touched libraries. in years uh, <laughs> yeah. but once it's in the quick load I actually it kind of reminds me of, of and explore more sonic possibilities that I ha- wouldn't have done in the regular template that I use so that's my take there Alex what do you do well, to be honest, I transitioned to the to the shell or shelf approach approach too in a way because to be honest, I have to say that I got really frustrated with Cubase recently. I mean, I'm a Cubase user and I'm a Studio One user, and it's always like, I hate you, and I run to the Which other one. <laughs> Sorry, better. guys, I just read a with... comment that I loved. Contact should have an inbuilt feature. You haven't used Symphobia in 490 days. <laughs> yes. I love That's that. a good idea. <laughs> That is actually a great idea. You haven't used it's this. Awesome. Well, it's, it's some libraries deserve not to be used for that long, but anyway. Wow. <laughs> some very expensive ones. What? What? Who's so you about? use shells too now, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Chris, so what about you? Say, and I just got con, uh, kind of frustrated <laughs> with Cubase because um, I I already spent like a few days building like a big template oh. with not really that much. I, I was still building it. And then suddenly I started, hey, you don't need to worry about that sloppy behavior. Uh, the more tracks you have in there by deactivating them. So you would just have like maybe four or five tracks going and the rest is deactivated. So technically you could have an entire template of like, you know, like just making up something like a thousand or two thousand tracks and they would be all deactivated sitting there except the basic stuff. So basically, you, you could load in everything you want or everything you need. However, recently, something happened. And every time I reactivate a track, it starts up as a solo defeated track. Means like when oh, really? you solo another track or you mute an, or when you solo another track, this track always stays on solo defeat. So what do you do? You go in there, left click, shift alt, and you have to un solo defeat it you know unarm it and i can't find <laughs> what's the problem it's somehow baked that doesn't in do that for my... me huh that doesn't happen to me that's weird yeah that's it's probably because it's me because i feel sometimes <laughs> it's like all these things happen to me all the time you know and it's 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 crazy and i would love really love to go over to uh studio one because the the approach of building or working with studio one is absolutely awesome because you have that sidebar and you can just save mm-hmm. presets, my awesome legato strings, and you just drag them over. You need a reverb, you just drag them over from the sidebar. So it's like you're sitting, like you're dragging stuff in, you just mix it, you know, like cooking. You just put it Able all on the line. Light. I love that. that pattern sequencer. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really awesome. And then, But then they have a problem or an issue with negative delay. And when you work with important libraries like... Um, nucleus or um you know performance samples you know the 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 flute shorts and all this stuff you need like at least minus 100 um, milliseconds of a negative delay otherwise the legato isn't right or the spiccato transitions you know and so so i once arranged a track for a very for an upcoming game but um I was totally unhappy because that was basically the reason why I switched back to Cubase. And now recently Cubase introduced this funny bug. I mean, hopefully they fix it, but this was one of the reasons spending like 10 years with templates and doing videos, you know, template talk and talking about how to set up stuff um, that I changed back to that. So fuck it, just load empty instances and route them all and just drag on, uh, drag in what you need. Yeah, but that's also another thing. I mean, working overall with templates, I mean, I think there's no though de- denying that 
a kind whatever type of template helps speed up the workflow because you don't create everything from scratch and repeat yeah. all the steps when creating a new track. But also on the other hand, once you get into the rebel hole, you have to remind yourself that this is a never ending ongoing journey to fire. And, and I one, know. once you grow uh, in, in your approach, when you acquire new libraries, how many of you guys have bought a library twice in your, in your time? I did. Yeah, once I certainly did. I, did. <laughs> I, I bought a library a second time because I didn't realize I had it already. <laughs> I forgot I had it too. Yeah. <laughs> so and and it's an ongoing approach and it ever changes. And uh, yeah, we had these deactivate templates. Then we had VE Pro, and everything has. Um, I think I'm meanwhile at a point in 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 my composer life where I have just several templates for several purposes. And uh, just it's like Daniel mentioned at the beginning, you have different colors in the shelf. And depending on what you want to paint, you know what colors you need to choose. And mm. uh, in the end, it all comes down to to helping you get the work done ASAP. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think I think for me personally, I um, and I'm sorry to say this, but I don't think I ever well, not like rarely use um, a template. Uh, that's, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Sure. I love how much you preface that, by the way, like you'd shot someone. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, you're all going to hate this. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, carry on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I personally see like the, the process of choosing track by track almost like, you know, like, like you've all been talking about starting from scratch, completely from scratch, and then saying like, okay, the tone of this piece is going to be like this. So what kind of instrument do I want here? And if it's a string library, you know, what, what string library is that going to be? Because then you know, you have to know the ins and outs of your your samples and how they all sound together. So it's like, it's, it's actually a fun process going through and it usually doesn't take too long. I mean, my computer actually takes a lot, a while to load the samples themselves. But the only time I'll really you ever use a template is if I'm writing in a genre that specifically only uses certain instruments. Like if it's a um, jazz band ensemble, then that's like, I'm, I'm definitely using this specific library for um those 16 instruments or something like that you know but other than that yeah. i really love working from scratch yeah in my in my template i used to do this thing and like what i would do is i would just drag uh, like if i was going for unique or i was trying to be like artsy fartsy or wanky or whatever i would just like drag in a sample without auditioning it i drag in like five or six samples and then just my job was to make it work you know yeah like that was always a fun thing like you wouldn't do that so much with like a full template you know <laughs> just like right. it'd be too chaotic to do that but like sometimes i'll just crack open ableton live which i still use by the way so like talking about templates and stuff my template in ableton is exactly the same as my template in cubase in the way it's structured but like if i'm doing edm or like again if i want to do something really sound designy i can just jump into ableton live and work the exact same way i just wish that ableton would let me change the key command so that i can trigger the, the stop go with the z like, does anybody else use that the keypad for like zero is stop one is back to mark yeah, one and enter is mm -hmm. go and, and has anybody else here sent a message to someone like on slack or something that just says zero one zero one zero one Anyone definitely discord all the time <laughs> one 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 enter yeah. and you're like what, what why is why is the music still playing and you look over and someone's like what the fuck are you talking about and it's just like oh one oh one g h g g g g g h h h <laughs> sorry it happened to Carry an audio on. director and he was like what what is going on it's like one 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 <laughs> yeah yeah one 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 every time It's the same thing as as your your track naming, like final version, final. Fuck it, though. now it's the real final. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can I can I just can I just put? Can, can we please can we please uh, all scorn whoever decided that F1 on the keyboard should load up the internet and then go to the manual of Cubase. <laughs> whoever whoever decided that should be taken out the back and beaten with a shoe. <laughs> Definitely. The amount of times I'm like, right, okay, I'm just going to push number one on the keyboard. Oh, no, apparently I'm going to Chrome. I'm going to Chrome, <laughs> am I? Right, okay, I'm going to browse the internet for 10 minutes. It, it doesn't work with my porn addiction. Like, once it's open, <laughs> you've, you've got, like, you know, you've got there, time. There you go, there you go. What? Anyway, <laughs> move on, Dirk. Quickly, yeah, on a side on. note, I just want to... On a side note, I just want to mention, I just checked the numbers where with Twitch and YouTube combined, we're close to 300 viewers. So thank you all oh, for tuning no. in. This is amazing. Awesome. I Thanks. actually love that. And I will, when the, uh, I made a huge mistake. <laughs> when that goes up <laughs> online afterwards, depending on if we don't fuck it up. Um, 
uh, I we will post will. the links to all your guys' channels so the people can uh, definitely follow along and uh, get notification cool. with the bell and everything when you go live and have all these I thingies think. going on. That's cool. Uh, talking about libraries and buying libraries twice and stuff like that and templates, one question was, I, I found that pretty interesting, uh, maybe a quick answer from each one of you. If you could only work with a free library or with some free stuff, what would you get? Ooh, I like this question. <laughs> And I'd be wanky and say I'd make them myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you you can. Yeah, yeah like I, if if it was if, <laughs> if I was forced to be using free stuff anyway, I mean, I be I would probably use Spitfire Labs. I'd probably use I'd probably use all of them. Project Sam. I'd probably use the the entire gambit of free stuffs in reality. But if it, if like we were in that situation, I'd much rather just try recording shit myself. Like I've got enough to write a score. I feel good point. You know, with just good a point, microphone yeah. and my synths. But if we I killed if, that conversation, if you, if, if you don't <laughs> if, if you don't have a mic available right now to record something, if, do you know of anything that's free available in the market that you actually do? Okay, like? so so one of my good friends, Jasper Blunk, who has also made a lot of the oh, samples that I use, he yeah. has a lot of good freebies. Well, actually, I think he may have just stopped them. Yeah, <laughs> I think he, he just, just continued. Them, but they them, were yeah. great when they. Ah. Were there. Well, thank angry you. Bra it was called angry. <laughs> it was called angry brass. Yes, I think yeah, it was, the free, and that was that was better than a lot of other brass that are, that you could even pay for. Yeah. Um, I, I just remembered a really good one, by the way. Uh, does anybody here have the G Town percussion? Yes. G -town percussion. Yes. G Town percussion is the greatest percussion library, <laughs> but you have to search for it. To if I remember, sorry, I, just, I just need to explain this. Is from what I heard, and again, I apologize if I get this wrong, but the story I like is that like there was a there was a conversation with a with a developer at the time who was adamant that no percussion must be recorded drive dry sorry so that you can add reverb later and then this guy comes along and he's like nah record it with the room record it with the room mics it will sound more real and everybody was like nah you're talking shit so the dude just went and recorded it and gave it away for free like fuck you and it's one of the greatest percussion libraries yeah. ever made <laughs> nice funny i've never heard of that but it's hard to find I, I, I got mine as an old giga file and i converted it with contact but like i did that in like 2008 so good luck it was back in the days of torrents if you remember those <laughs> when that was a thing i've, I've never heard of those times. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that the legit torrents that that was the only way you could get it yeah. like was through torrents because it's free it's not like i'm not pirating it it was a free library yeah, right. given away but the only way to get hold of it was to go through a torrent oh. it was but i think there was a website right at some point where he yeah but it got shut down them. that's the thing that's what okay. I'm saying. It's like, and the and all the files are like, uh, yeah. you know, the links have expired and stuff. So you have to like dig for it. I mean, I have it. I could just upload it to you guys and not be a dick. But then again, I'm lazy. So like, again, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> you don't want to give your secrets away, right? <laughs> what what other free stuff is there? Like, I'm I'm actually trying to think now. I know Spitfire just released their yeah, thing. Yeah, I know. Which is that I cool wanted to free. mention uh, Spitfire the Lab series. I mean, they have a shit ton of stuff in there. Yeah, I with use some great of them. sounding instruments. I use some of these on on stuff that I worked on. Uh, they I love their Chimbalom, for example, from their from the Lab series. It's a great sound. If you layer that with piano, you it's had such a nice texture. So that is definitely a great start uh, for free stuff. Uh, the Spitfire Lab series. Yeah, let uh, me just add in there. Um, Orchestral Tools has their layers, uh, which is oh, basically a so cool. correct, portal, correct. portal uh, library. Yeah, the only thing it just doesn't have is a legato feature. So you, when you play one chord to another, it doesn't automatically turn off the previous chord, which uh, a library like Cine Orc from Cine Samples does have. The other one is Project Sam's The Free Orchestra, and they actually made it for a contact player now, which is really, really Good. cool. But it's basically excerpts from their Symphobia series. Yeah, I think it's derived from their Symphobia series, stuff. right? Yeah, yeah. And True Strike and, and Lumina, like all, all their big collections. And then they released them all for free over like the course of a few months. And then they repackaged it into this free thing for Contact Player. So. Dude, dude, you're just talking about free libraries. You just made me realize how many fucking sample libraries there are in the world. There's I just had many. like an existential <laughs> crisis. Yeah. I was like, sweet Jesus, there's so many. There's so many. <laughs> But it's amazing. It's like everyone's trying to, and then of course BBC Discover came out, right? So that one's also free. Indeed, too. it did. I'm quickly, sorry, I have to go to pee. I, I will be back. Oh, <laughs> Christ! I have the same problem, Love but I'm hosting this thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll host it, Derek. Right, okay. Derek, you, can was... go, we'll host no, it. you can go take a slash. I'll take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mute, I mute myself, and I will hand uh, it over to Daniel for a moment. I will be back there in a go. second. Okay. Okay. That's so, risky, guys, what's, what's the industry? Intimate. What's the industry like over in Australia? Like, yes. we didn't hear Mate, about that. It's, we it's pretty slow over here, eh? Um, 
I've tried to well, find work in Australia people, before, well, I... but I've just done <laughs> work doesn't Sorry, work. Daniel, oh my Sorry. goodness. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. You teased that one up and I just wanted to knock oh. it out of the park. No, no, Sorry, I invited ahead. that one. I'm invited. It's already gone off the rail. Sorry. Sorry, oh, I, I'm, I'm a dick. Carry on. I'm a, dick, I'm a shit. Come host. back. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> nah, dude. So one of your videos that you did, did you, the, uh, the How to Train Your Dragon video, you uploaded that, right? Like I watched I don't that think on I did. YouTube. I think I just chucked that on SoundCloud. I on think. SoundCloud, I I... that was one of the greatest recreations, and I've found that about most YouTube uh, in general is a lot of the videos are like covers and mock-ups and you know interpretations of things, and it's mm. it's so cool for me. The thing that I learn most, you know, because obviously my my skill, like I'm over the skill bar, most of us are. But the thing I like to watch is when someone's interpreting a piece of music in their own kind of style. I like to see mm. that because I get to see like a different through line of that piece of music that I didn't see before. Like I'm, I'm getting a look into how that person's heard the music, you know, the emotion mm. that they took away from it. And sometimes it doesn't line up with mine. So I always find that the most interesting to, to like look at. Do, do you guys find that particularly with like when you hear like, you know, the, the new YouTube composer scene? Do you tend to find that like it's interesting hearing their voice? What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think hey, you press the hey, set again. Take it away, Dirk. <laughs> Dirk, it wasn't anything of note. Continue. Uh, you are actually you did a you did a not bad job, DJ. Yeah, that was, good. That was uh, and amazing. Thank you so much Entry, for taking yes. all there. Uh, but it's yeah. way more relaxed now. And the Germans this suitably <laughs> pee free. It's all the beer. That's what it is. It's all the German beer. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> So Alex, you know, miss, the well. main reason why I do remakes in general, like that's my way of, of like learning. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so I'm just trying to figure out how to get my stupid <laughs> virtual instruments to sound like something that's real. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Reverse not, engineering. Not only, not only like the virtual, like the MIDI massaging side of it, but for me, I nerd out heaps on the, the mixing side of it all as well. Right. So trying to just force things to sound real is, is doing mock-ups. Did you, is, did you see and, that? And tweet? by the way, I'll go on. Th- no, the, the 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 other really good thing about doing mock-ups of existing pieces is you you absorb the orchestration and and all the all the techniques that the composer yeah. used to make it, and you end up you know translating it into your own work, and it's, it's just a cool way of learning. It works. Yeah, because you're critically analyzing even like those little features, yeah. those little things. You, that you're you literally having of. to be every person in the orchestra or whatever, exactly, and yeah. yeah, so it's cool. That's by, by the way. That's another. I was talking to Alex when we uh, were uh, testing the environment this this morning. Uh, Zoom is working. Everything we were talking about that. Uh, I thought you guys just went and had a chat then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I really like that, and this goes along with the job we are doing. I mean, Alex mentioned he's a guitarist. I play decently keys and can find my way around. And and uh, you're a cellist, uh, Blake, as we all know. Um, I. One well. tip that I can give when people ask how do you achieve realism in the instruments is even if you don't learn to play violin, but just fucking grab the instrument at some point in your life and have it in your hand and get an understanding of how... My cursing's rubbed off on Dirk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, 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 just grab it in your hand and see how it feels, even if you don't get a decent tone out of it, but at least have an, you write differently once you had your hands on an actual physical instrument and have an, or try to mm. blow a trumpet. Suddenly you start to realize <laughs> oh, that tried. it may be a good idea to... To, to have breathing pauses in between the lines and something like that mm-hmm. to just make it a little bit more realistic. So um, what I want to say is uh, oh. get out of your comfort zone, even if you try to, to get in touch with the music school in your area or with the university or any, anything that has instruments available or go to orchestra s- uh, mm. settings, something like that, and try to get a deeper understanding of what that I instrument sounds totally like in right. real life. Because I, the most of the stuff that I hear that I think is probably a, not, that that I admit doesn't sound great, I think it's because the people don't actually they haven't really internalized what that instrument actually sounds like, or they haven't they don't really understand what an orchestra actually sounds like. Do you know what I mean? So how, it, it's an uphill battle to then try and recreate it if you if you don't understand the intricacies of it all, and whether that's by just listening to it heaps or by like you said picking up an instrument. So one tip on the side there. Uh, question for Christopher. I just see here, since you have a piano background, how much do you care about the keybed of MIDI controller and which one do you use? Yeah. Um, I, for me, the feeling is actually quite a lot to do with how I end up performing it in real time, I think. 
Um, cause you know, the, the best way to perform natural lines, I think is, is to play with one hand and then use the mod wheel for the other. Uh, but in general, I, I like a, a heavier feel and the one I use is Arturia's key lab 88. So it's on the, it's on the pricier side. It's like a thousand dollars or something. Um, but it comes in black and white. It has all the knobs and stuff you pretty much need. And it, it feels, it feels great. It's a little on the heavy side as well. So, um, if you're looking for something that's maybe a little bit lighter, maybe Checo completes or something. I don't, I'm not sure of that many options to be honest. Daniel wants to say something, but, uh, I'm just, yeah, from my experience, the, uh, <laughs> the, the Art I'm 12 years old. It's just the, the knob comment just made me like, oh, okay. all, the need, all the knobs you could need. It just caught me off. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to my apologies. I'm, sorry to <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, literally a child. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, uh, to yeah. talk, talking about live instrument, there was a question in the chat. Uh, who of us has worked with live orchestra yet? Oh, Chris. Oh, Chris. I know. I'm, so I'm sorry. He's the one, yes, he said, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we were shaming so him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You pleb. What a you setup. Pleb, what a dead. setup. Yeah. No, it's actually it's actually <laughs> definitely a goal. Um, especially at the begin. Uh, sorry, the end of this year. Uh, I, I wrote a um, a big band chart for jazz band, so I'm definitely looking forward to having that played by live musicians. The only, I mean, year. I loved every okay. every single second of the experience, uh, be it in uh, working with the string quartet. Uh, if someone is somewhere playing your music that you kind of thought in that strange brain of There's yours, else and like someone it. else yeah. is performing it, it's the greatest thing ever. The only thing yeah. that I regret about having the experience of working with live musicians is going back afterwards and working right. in the box you're spoiled again. yeah <laughs> this sucks <laughs> yeah yeah you so, want to make sure everything has been recorded with click yeah mm. of course yeah of course but yeah there is uh there is uh especially for a composer i think it's it's kind of the it always felt like a little threshold like wherever you are in your career it's that point when you kind of finally get to work with live performances of your stuff it's kind of a little threshold that you cross it's like a special it's a very special moment at least that's what it felt like for me way to call me out guys nice all right let's go yeah let's continue. <laughs> correct correct and um there was also a question of uh, do you consider uh, that there's a lot of ev uh, development in online courses training for composers uh evident comes to mind evident courses that's what i know of uh, trailers sound design courses and stuff like that uh, do you guys see that uh, comparable to the standard education from back then at university or whatever? So can you can you make your way with these kind of online uh, offers that are available nowadays? Is that comparable or do you see a major difference between the two education types? I, I think it depends on the way you, you learn. Uh, some people some people can learn just by reading a book. Like a lot of people can't. Some people need to see something, ex you know, like explained to them, shown to them. Some people need to do it for themselves before they get it. So it just depends on the kind of person you are. Like some people are really good at school and some people are really shit at school. But the people who are shit at school aren't always failures in life. You know what I mean? They're just not good at the academia side of it. So for those types of people, learning by yourself is usually better. Like I, I did, I did really badly in school. For some reason, I just, you know, I can't focus in a school-like environment. And I did go to music school to learn to be a singer, but I only did it for two years. I was, I was a good boy for the first year, and then the second year, I fell apart. You know, just I got bored, as as you, you tend just to in do. The corner, which is just, right? <laughs> Yeah, that I got sent out of classrooms and stuff. I'm like, I'm an adult. Hello. I shouldn't be sent out of the classroom. Anyway, um, but you know what I mean? It's so like I learned a lot of what I did, you know, just on, on the internet because the information's there. But that's not to say like there's something there's something to be said about someone correcting you when you're making a mistake. Because sometimes it's like singing is a good example because you can sing and practice all you want, but if no one's correcting your bad mis like your bad habits then you're going to have those bad habits and you will sound like the end result will be poor, you know? So you, it's always good to have someone, even if you're like, if you're learning by yourself, it's good to have someone whose work you respect, genuinely listen to your work and give you honest feedback. And when, if you're asking for honest feedback, you can't get pissed off if they give you like, this isn't very mm. good. You know, like you have to get through that stage. <laughs> so like, if you're learning by yourself, you have to have like a corrector. You have to have someone who set, make sure that like, they're checking for any bad habits you're forming because that's what school it, that's what school excels at is like getting it's discipline it's getting those bad habits out so that you that's what the academia is about it's the discipline of learning a subject under like under a set of rules 
Like that's the rules of the game. You know what I mean? You don't talk during lessons. You don't go out. You don't do this. You focus. Whereas when you do it by yourself, you could be having a wank while doing it. You know what I mean? There's no rules <laughs> when you're learning something. So it's you've just got to you know you just got to kind of do it. But anyway, I so both that like you can be you can you can have a career either way, but it depends on how you learn. And it depends on uh, if you could, if you have someone you trust to actually correct you. That's I think what that's, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's one reason so many people jump into courses with a community aspect, like membership sites and just online courses in general that have some sort of homework assignments or um, things where the the the, uh, the author or the you know the director will will actually go over your work for you, and that that just brings the value up so much more. And just in general, like the the concept of an online course is so much more affordable than three to four years of, of school. And usually you can learn, you know, all that condensed information pretty well in a in a in a well structured course. So um, yeah, I, I, I like Daniel said, it's just down to personal taste what you prefer to learn. But I think courses are a wonderful thing if they're if they're done correctly. Yeah. Uh, Blake, as as coming from an educational background, what's your take on? Uh, I just want to, Whoa, to cite one. I, I, uh, what, just want to say one thing that I read in the chat uh, that I find interesting. Uh, of course, 15 hours of video course cannot substitute three to four years of education at a yeah. university. Of course, but maybe <clears throat> five courses totally. with 15 hours each can. I think <laughs> surprisingly, I find myself agreeing with Daniel again. Uh, it. Uh, <laughs> 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 Love you, bro. It um, it is. It's. It totally depends what kind of learn you are. I, I actually went to to university to study how to do uh, to study composition and well music and all that in general. And I I um, I wasn't a person who tech, who did very well at school either. I can only focus on things that I know that that I'm very interested in. And I and for me, I found the music official you know education to be too broad for the specific area that I wanted to go into, which was, you know, creating orchestral music with a computer. <laughs> and so I, I quickly turned to online courses. Uh, Mike Verda, I learned, uh, I've signed up to a bunch of his stuff. He has some great masterclasses on orchestration and stuff like that. Um, Joel um, Doily, I don't know how do we say his last yeah, name. Doily. He just put out an awesome... I think it's um, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. But but he's got a really good mixing course that is uh, as well that I learned heaps from. Um, there there is like if you are the kind of person that's motivated enough, you, I mean, you can learn everything that you want from the internet easily, um, and you can self direct your own learning. And I don't really think that and you're at a you're at a disadvantage anymore by not having a you know a piece of paper that says you can do the job. And can I just point out, like, learning doesn't have to be like, you don't have to go to an educational video. Like, like we are all YouTube composers here. Like, you can learn just by watching people work. You know, like, you can, you have to, when, you, when you're trying to educate yourself, you have to know what you're trying to achieve. The more specific you know what, you know what it is you're trying to learn, the more you're, the more likely you are to actually learn it. Because then you'll start absorbing the information when it's given to you, even when you're not paying attention. So if you're like, I need to sound like Hans Zimmer, you can get close to that just by listening to Hans Zimmer. Then if you see someone who's writing like Hans totally. Zimmer, you'll get even better. That's what I'm saying. Or it's like your brain- Try recreating add... Hans Zimmer track. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's and, and like, well, that's what I'm saying, Blake. It's like, I could totally yeah. like- the the I swear I saw a video of your how to train your dragon thing. Um, maybe or maybe I did. I've forgotten what I put up there. But but like just looking at it, I, I looked at it. I just watched one playthrough, and I I was like, fuck yeah, like that makes so much sense. You know what I mean? And I learned something just by seeing stuff that like you know it it's just like those stupid things that you should have known. You know, like you yeah. see like a little technique, mm. and you're like, why haven't I been doing that? You know? Yeah, it's like and so for, like that is I get heaps of light well. bulb moments from from that. You know, it's like oh, so Powell's doing that with the trombones, and you know he's doing exactly. power chords with this voicing, and it always works. And so yeah. I'm going to use that too. Yeah. It's exactly. Like and it doesn't always have to be a technique. Sorry, it doesn't always have to be a technique either. It's like learning learning the little tricks that make you faster because there's something that needs to be said being a composer. Speed is an actual genuine thing you need a lot of the time. And so when mm. you're watching people, don't just watch for the music thing. Watch how they're loading things quicker than you load them and mm. be like, wait, how right. did you do that? 
Yeah, and watch so how they use shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts and yes, stuff like that. That's to, important to, education as well. That's as important as the music sometimes. Because sometimes yeah, you're only given true. a week to write an hour, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, you right. know. And, and actually, ready. talking about, I'm, I'm with Blake on that, uh, that uh, Joel Dolier, I think that's the way to pronounce his uh, last name. Uh, he just wrote mm. in the chat. Uh, absolutely recommended course. And that brings me to a question that I was asked uh, before the stream. Uh, being a composer nowadays uh, obviously involves more than just writing some black dots on a piece of paper and then hand it out to a team uh, but it involves yeah obviously laying down <laughs> the MIDI and then mixing and a lot of times especially in the field of production music mastering as well so how do you guys <laughs> feel about the fact uh, doing that all in one Love person it. or so do, you, do, do you prefer to have you work with mixing engineers before have you handed out to have your stuff mixed by someone else what's to your experience honest, and sorry. what what do you like about it or what do you don't like about it To be honest, Dirk, if I could, if I could have my way, I would roll out in the bed, roll out of the bed in the morning, just shout music, and then like a team would go away and they would just form it together. Oh, you're not far off from that, Daniel. Just trust me. Feed me. No, like <laughs> if I had my way. But the, like, uh, I do enjoy the fact, so I came from, I, I imagine some of you guys did as well, came from more of like a song background. Like I was in a band yeah. kind of thing, you know, so it was nice. all about learning the techniques and stuff anyway. So, you know, sorry, go on, someone else have a go. Hey, yeah. so um, I, I think a, a, a big part of my, you know, the reason why I'm able to do what I do now is not necessarily because I write good music, but it's because I it nerded out with how to actually, I nerded out with how to use virtual instruments. Do you know what I mean? I actually mm -hmm. got my first job, I think, and I hadn't really written music before, but I'd done a lot of mock-ups. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think that, um, I think these days you kind of need to be able to, um, if you can't produce something that sounds amazing, you need to pay someone who can, otherwise you're at risk of not really yeah. getting any work. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I agree. Like I came from like a sound design background as well, you know, like doing the rock stuff. So it kind of contributes, you know, towards those future goals, you know? Mm -hmm. right, Alex, what, what about you? You like the mixing side of things or... <clears throat> Sorry, you like the mixing side of things, or would you rather have someone else do it? Or well, what's your what's your take on it? Well, I'm always happy, you know, when when there is a live session going on, when when some game track or something will be recorded with a live session. I would always happy to do to go, you know, call my orchestrator and say I sent you the MIDI files, you know, because I don't want to waste any time with it. Um, and it's not because I don't like you know music theory or you know working working out how the or a perfect arrangement for the orchestra, but there are better people at this. And the same goes for mixing and mastering. If there is somebody saying, hey, deliver that trailer album, but just, you know, make it stems and we will take care of the rest. We will mix it and master it. I would say, I'm happy, just do it because there are pros sitting there and doing it. And if there's a budget, I wouldn't have a problem to just call. So I, I, I called some mastering studio to master me a track I've written for a sample library, which was rejected by the way, but that's how it, that's how it goes sometimes. But I find it, nevertheless, I find it very um, vital to just, as you said before, you know, grabbing like a, a violin or a cello and just see how it works. You definitely have to get a feeling for mixing, mastering, and all these things which are involved. And beyond that, you you have to get into marketing too, you know, nowadays. So um, to how to promote yourself, how to build your brand and all these things. So um, yeah, I, definitely I feel a like must. The more you, I feel like the more you do it all yourself as well, the more of a control freak you actually become with it all. You know what I mean? So the more like you get used to your own particular way of mixing and mastering. Yeah. And then when you have to hand it off and they're like, can you just render that like 6 dB lower? And you're like, how about you go fuck yourself? Like, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's how you feel. Obviously, you don't say that, but it's like you, you get very particular about it. Don't. It's always the thing as well when they're like, oh, this will be good when it's mixed. And I'll be like, what did you say? What, <laughs> what, did, what yeah. do you mean? Yeah. Like, and it's like you're fine. Yeah. Especially when you spend like, Excuse me? five nights on, on getting the mix That's right. That's actually a really good point. And, I, and I'm still going like, I'm, I went through a big phase where what I thought sounded good Yep. actually probably didn't sound as good as what I thought it did. Do you know what I mean? Right. And, and part of that, that, that's another whole topic of ear training. But, and, and this leads to a question you asked a while back, which is what was something you would tell yourself, you know, five years ago, I would say train your damn ears. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like yeah. um, learn, you know, be able to identify frequencies like that, you know, um, because that helps 
so much and learn to hear compression you know if you're someone who's wanting to actually make you know good sounding mixes um because what you think sounds good doesn't always sound good to the rest of the world yeah funny enough that you mentioned that what i found for (laughs) myself is uh that uh over time getting a deeper understanding of like you mentioned frequencies and and how uh especially certain instrument ranges interact uh help me to also orchestrate better and and uh, write better because I know I can slam the double basses and the trombones and the low woodwinds everything in the same place because it's just a big pile up of low end shit. I'm so a so uh, understanding more of the mixing side of things helped me to actually get better before the actual mixing happens and make That's it sound such a good, good point. already. Like orchestration mm-hmm. is literally old school mixing. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. and, and 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 as I learn more about mixing, I see. Oh, John Williams does this thing with his brass, and then and then later on, I understand why because yeah, you know, the way the frequencies work together makes so much more sense from a mixing perspective. You know, it's yeah. literally just all mixing. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it's it's like, like the high string, master high, sucked high, high piccolo all together. You know, like an yeah. super <laughs> shrill. It's like you don't do that because so I'm going to EQ it and then put that down on a clarinet. Yeah, really. I'm going to put that down there. That's a really good way of looking at. It. I've never heard it put that way. <laughs> well done, well done, you genius. <laughs> there you go. Right, there you go. Um, I like it. <laughs> Thank Make you a so t-shirt. Much. I I'll buy it. Also, I'll wear it. I would also just let the chat know that we're nearing the last <laughs> round of questions. So if you have anything that you feel is not answered yet, now's the time to post about it because we are closing soon. Closing shop in When right around started? 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. just started. Uh, I mean, giving giving for Daniel, that was just the introduction. So the actual That's right, talk yeah. is now happening for the <laughs> next be, five hours. <laughs> to be honest, I feel like I'm just settling in. Doug. I'm like, right, go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I appreciate yeah, all the insight we have so far. Then. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Carry on. Um, the stream has been disappointing. I don't see a single round table. I bet that guy came <laughs> from your stream, Daniel. <laughs> I know that guy. Don't mind. listen to him. He's but an Australian. I, I actually love the other one. This is so great. Four composers and Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is true. cruel. It's true. It's true. It's true. Nah, it's cruel. Don't listen. Don't Time listen to the trolls, that. Chris. That don't listen to the trolls. Trolls. Yeah, we, we mean and un- that, Mr. Foreman. Uh, one question. I, I, I mean, like... it's fucking funny, but that was unnecessary <laughs> and cruel. No, no, no. So, I, I could have substituted with my name. Composer. The, the cool there. thing is that we know that is not true. So that's the great thing about it. Anyway, one <laughs> question was. So mean. What's your ten-year goal? slash dreams where do you see yourself what do you want to have accomplished in 10 years time chris who's that too playing um, wars on twitch and make a living from it love it <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no i love it uh, yeah that's great um you want to make a living from twitch is that what you said Alex. Oh, you mean me? Yeah, yeah, I just said, you know, playing Warzone on twitch and make a living <laughs> <from it. laughs> oh dude that's I, the I mean, dream yeah, live, go for it that's the dream right there No, I'm just, you know, <laughs> someone serious. There's, there's half truth to that. What is it? Many a true word has been said in jest. I, I, I reckon there's a degree of truth to that, a sliver of truth. I'm, I'm behind you. I'm behind you. You'd do well at that. You'd Definitely. I mean, I played games when I was nine years old. I grew up with games. You know, I'm a video game composer and I'm in slash trailer, licensed music, whatever, and some sort of arranger. Yeah, But, and you look I like mean, a military bloke. You literally look like you could tear me to pieces. Like if I said the wrong word, you would tear me apart with your bare hands. Like if you play right Warzone there. games, it's the aesthetic. You've got yeah. it, you know? You've got the look. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, Chris, you were saying. We're being so rude be. to Chris. No. Yeah, Chris, no, back, man, back so in the game, sorry. where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, in 10 years, I would love to... Uh, be affiliated with Disney in some way. Uh, I think that's my my dream job, just to be uh, either composer or arranger um, in Disney Studios. I, I honestly don't think that. that's 10 years away. Yeah. Okay, 20, yeah. sorry. No, rather <laughs> less, rather less. <laughs> anyway, Blake, what, what, about, what about you? you? <laughs> well, 10 years, like, I often get asked what my long-term goal is, and I, I, I thought uh, for a while there that it was, you know, to be a movie composer or whatever do you know what i mean right right for films so, um but uh and while i still love the idea of that i don't think that i'm, I'm my heart set on any particular direction I, i think and i think that's because i'm finding a lot of satisfaction in what i'm doing now you know like um in, in you know the, all the other shorter forms of media I'm, i'm really enjoying it and and honestly i'm just holding on for the ride i just want to be wherever 
I just want to be surrounded by people that are better than me. Do you know what I mean? And that's what I'm finding myself in at the moment. I'm, I'm sending mixes to, to legendary mixes, you know, of world class that, I know I've got to up my game every time and I know <laughs> I know where my weaknesses are and they make sure to let me know. And you know what I mean? I'm getting constantly pushed and mm -hmm. that's I, I get I get high off of getting better. <laughs> so for me that's great. That's cool. That's cool. I think that's very, very important to surround yourself with people that you know are more capable of stuff in certain areas than you are. Because that forces you to push and to get yourself uh better. Yeah, in totally. These areas. Mm -hmm. Daniel, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Well, if I'm still alive, um, where do I see myself in 10 years? Uh, to be honest, like I'll probably just be doing the same kind of shit. Like the thing I realized, the thing I realized, I was looking, I was looking at my career and stuff, you know, I was having one of those moments. And I realized that, you know, we like I was saying earlier, live stream allowing me to be more me. It's happening musically too, as well. You know what I mean? Like I'm doing more music that like speaks to me rather than just doing the movie and trying to chase that movie dream that everyone seems to have and the thing is, is the closer i've got to it like it's like seeing the ugly bits you don't see from afar you know what i mean it's mm. like getting close and realizing they were actually ugly yeah <laughs> you know what i mean but from a distance they look like a solid seven you get close and they're like a three on a good day you know and so i it's like it's a tough industry it's it's got a lot of things that you need to do you know and it's a lot of pressure and just a lot of kind of nasty people in it as well you know like a lot of it's a sharky industry the movie industry it's just this and and like i see some of these composers and like you know they they're able to do like 15 movies in a year or something you know like a hans or like a lawn or something and i i just think like i think about the times i've done a feature film and how how much that drained me as a human you know what i mean i'm thinking doing 15 in a year That's just like, that's not a degree. Like to me, that stopped being success. Stop being the person who does 15 a year. If I can get one a year, I'm still a success in my book. I'm still mm. doing a job that I've dreamt of doing. I'm still achieving. I'm still presenting it every year. I get to reinvent something brand new and, you know, I don't need to do 15 different versions of the same thing to be considered more of a success. You know what I mean? So I think what I've decided that I want to do. And so over the next 10 years, I'm going to try and actually put into place is to do more things that I want to do, do enough so that I can maintain the life I want, but then do like, not just take jobs because they're a Hollywood gig or not just take a video game because it's a video game gig. I feel like that whole like composer thing of proving myself. I feel like I've done that now. Like I'm, I'm very fortunate, you know, like all the projects and things that I've done have met, put me at a point where I can go like, okay, okay, I, I don't need to like kind of prove that I've done it. Like I, it kind of speaks for itself. So I want to kind of get more into my own thing. You know, like I feel like I, I just want to go down that and do something and live more of a life. You know, that to me is a more successful life. So just do do enough to make, you know, to satisfy my own need for, you know, creativity and output and then actually live the life and do the music and do the things I want to do. I'm privileged. I understand that because I'm in a position where I can say shit like that. Not everyone's that like, but in, in you know, if we're speaking specifically, I've been fortunate enough to be in a position where that's what I want to do with my next 10 years. Yeah. But yes. So for me, cool. it's, it's it's kind of uh, uh, sorry. What's someone? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to to I mean go ahead, but I just wanted to um, you know answer this question on a more serious note. So what I you know oh no finally, no you mean the games was not serious? <laughs> yes, yes, but I just have to appear serious, you know, and make a better impression than just saying <laughs> that games is everything. <laughs> but basically, I have to totally agree with what what Daniel says, and this was basically my my short phrase like i see myself in 10 years like making a living on twitch with war playing you know call of duty warzone it's basically what he said that there are so many composers out there and they 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 say they see being successful in the film industry and then they slam out or they they are confronted with like composing music for like five to ten you know, movies, and then they're so exhausted and strung out and they just, you know, eat garbage and don't do sports or don't do, they, they don't, they stop living, you know, and this is like, um, I'm for, I mean, I honestly say I'm 45 right now and I'm in the position of okay. saying what I actually do Dude. is I love. Huh? <laughs> no way. <laughs> you look like you look 28. So young. He looks yeah. so young, doesn't he? I'm nearly half your age. Yeah. Yeah. In 10 years, I want to look like Alex Pfeffer. 
I have the yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm sort of on my way there. Like, I've got the beard, the hair's going a bit. Like, I'm catching you up, Alex, mate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You just lo- have to lose a bit of more hair. Gonna up here. My, I feel like you've cornered there. the beard market. Like, I was get, like, I've started growing it, and people have drawn comparisons already. Someone was asking what beard oil you use. And I'm like, oh, I need to get some cool. of that. <laughs> so we have to Don't worry, I linked you up. Into, it's, uh... You know, growing a beard in Blade yeah. 2 and Christopher. <laughs> no, it's not no. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it, dude. I've been trying for years. <laughs> yeah. So for myself, 10 years, um, and I think this goes along with the next question or next topic that I have in mind that was asked in the in the chat. Uh, there was a question on uh, if you can survive on personal music projects alone, and I want to quickly touch on the topic of... Uh, <clears throat> diversification, diverse your income streams, have several uh, irons in the fire, as we used to say in Germany. Um to answer the question specifically he asked i was asked about uh, elements if you can make money from that no you can't not in these times unless you have a million plays on spotify a day or something like that um i see myself in 10 years still making what i do like not talking about going to work but talking about going to have fun in the morning because that's what i do now I don't go to work. I go to have fun because I love what I'm doing and it, I don't consider it work. Even it can be stressful at times and it can be tight. It's still fun and I still love it. And I actually have uh, sometimes uh, trouble to calm myself down for other stuff. So there's other stuff outside the work world. There is a family. There is uh, sleep. <laughs> and stuff like that. What That's how you, you know you love me? it. That's how you know you're made so, for it. So uh, this is something... Sleep? Uh, I don't want to see too much having changed in 10 years. I want to still do the same stuff and have fun with what I do. And I want to be in the lucky position to say I am able to make a living from that. So I still make enough dough to pay my bills with what I do. Uh, I would love to be in that position. Coming from that and then talking about that other stuff. uh, Do you live from personal projects or... I think that it's absolutely crucial to uh, branch out into as much different territories as possible as you physically can handle uh, in terms of workload. That means, uh, for me, it's production music. It's every now and then uh, working on a film score, on a game score. I mean, I'm not really hunting film scores, to be honest, because I'm more rooted in the production music world and I love it. Um, But if someone comes along, I don't mind working on it and i love it i did three feature films and i did a full game score and stuff like that and it can be fun for sure um but i'm not chasing it actively right now because i'm actually pretty happy in the productive music world but then there is every now and then you need time for a personal outlet that is not really so when i did elements for example i was uh grateful for the opportunity to not think about client wishes but actually just doing something for the sake of something to do i love just writing the music that i feel good with that i don't need to think about what project can it be used for what emotion do i need to transfer but just writing for the sake of writing but this is nothing that necessarily pays the bills you know so this is rather a personal like using the hobby aspect of of what we do so that's kind of the 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 fun zone and then you have the work zone which still can be fun of course um so what, what's your take on uh, diversification of income streams and, and uh, where, what advice can you give up-and-coming composers to, to uh, broaden? Uh, I think the same question that goes along, sorry, I just want to add that. Uh, how long did it take you to go full-time? So uh, the transition from doing it on the side to, to full-time, that's one of the most asked questions that I get. Uh, maybe we can uh, shed some light on that as well. Alex, your take? Yeah. Um, well, I think it took kind of like five years to go full time, but I was fortunate enough to start as a guitar teacher back then. So I had kind of like a little bit of income to pay the rent and stuff like this. And then I transitioned to game music. And then this, at the same time, it split into getting to, into license and trailer music. Um so, but all in all, I mean, I'm saying five years, it probably took until I was making money from the, you know, from the licensed music when I got finally paid for some TV or movie trailers. So, I I mean, it could get, you, you can get faster than that, 
maybe in like six months or a year, or maybe you have some savings aside and you can just you transition into something which just works. But I think the most important thing today with having in mind that that video is the marketing, uh, you know, how do you say the medium number one, um, it's really important to build like this, um, you know, like having a Twitch account or streaming live to YouTube or having a YouTube channel. Because if you stay on that consistently on a range of like 10 to 20 years, besides working for projects, um, this definitely, what I mean jokingly in the past, will happen one day that you wake up and you have like 50,000 or 100,000 or 200,000 subscribers and you fire up, you know, your light here and you just, you know, hit the record screen and, and jump on a live, you know, session, writing a track. And you have like, when you have like, you know, imagine to that point when you have like 100, 200,000 200, followers, you get some subs, you get some donations, you mention like a library you worked on, um, then suddenly you sell something, then people watch your YouTube videos, you have like some affiliate links, and then people watch over and say, hey, what is it? What is that microphone that guy is using? And then I, I had this experience that somebody th through my affiliate links went to Amazon and said, okay, I got that microphone. Let's get like a 1,400 pound iPad. <laughs> and I got like 5% from that. And I mean, this is like this little money. But the thing is what I'm trying to say, you don't force anyone to spend money on what you do. People totally by themselves, you know, if, if it's a donation on Twitch, if it's monetization money on YouTube, you don't force anyone. You will get that. If it's an affiliate link on Amazon, nobody has to pay you additional money. It's just a little, you know, a little percentage, which is going to you. And people would probably more welcome to give you that split rather than to the distributor or the developer of the, of the product. So I think combined, coming back to the question, sorry, I drifted off a little, but combining all this to look out for work and building your channels will definitely lead you know, we have this one door where you can look for opportunities to work. So like the typical Dynec, <laughs> do you need a composer? Mm. But there is also this other, this other door where you can build everything you want yourself. And this is one of my, this is my favorite motto. You know, life is not about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself. And if you just sit there and you want to make content happen, if you want to bring a message across, then sooner or later, there is, um, th you will find that target group out there. It just takes a long time to build this, you know? Yeah. Sorry for drifting off a little no, bit no, here. No, totally no. fine. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I forgot that. Affiliate links are actually a great thing, especially in the YouTube world and being on YouTube and, and sharing your content. And like, if you do sample library reviews and people, for I, for example, I have some affiliate links with with uh, sample library developers. So, so if I showcase the sample library and someone after my stream is inclined to head over there and buy it, uh, and the developer offers me like a 5% or whatever, even 2%, whatever share of their sale that is generated through me sending someone their way. I don't see anything wrong with that. And actually, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And it just shows some appreciation for your work, so to say, or for, for uh, yeah, if I send someone along to, to spend some money on them, I'm fine with that. And uh, I don't think that there is an... Uh, conflict of uh, someone mentioned to me that if that's a conflict of interest or something so you're not not unbiased yeah, like, in your review I, i've never done that I've, I've never done that just because like at the time when that was a thing i was getting a lot of shit you know like particularly over like the hands in a strings thing you know back in that time when that kind of came around and like i it to me it was just work like it wasn't worth people suggesting that i was saying shit because of money you know what i mean or saying this because you get like you're only saying this is good because you're going to make money off the end and so like with that kind of stuff like I mean, yes, there's money to be made there, but at, at the same time, it's like my whole thing is that like I just speak my mind and it's hard to do that with that kind of thing hanging around. That's just a negative part of trying to be like, you know, the way I do things, which isn't the yeah, way I, to do think, things. Trust I me. I think you would be honest. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think I'm you not, would be I'm honest not saying with that. that you're being dishonest. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you're being dishonest. No. I'm just saying that like, it's it's just something I never have to deal with. It's just like a worry off of my back. Like, because yeah. people will, like, if you do that, even though I know for a fact that you two don't do that, you know, people will still say it. 
Yeah, and it's I still know. a thing that they try and say that, oh, his opinion isn't valid because. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to give them that ammo. Like, I'll make me money some other way where they can't, like, attach it to something. Like, that's, you know, that's why, like, I do like you. I do, like, the revenue streams with some library music that I've done years ago. Just a little stream there, a little bit of YouTube stream, a little bit of Spotify stream. And it's funny, all these little tiny streams eventually add up to, like, you know, a yeah. month's rent or something, you know, and that's just from the stuff you did five years ago. So that's always a good way to make a bit of money. But like the little, the little bits of money from like money, like I'm still struggling with whether or not to like on Twitch have a subscribe button. You know what I mean? Because I don't want, I, like, I do, I do the Twitch thing for fun and by you know by side thing, my YouTube things for fun. So I don't want people to like, I don't want it to feel like a job. You know what I mean? Because if I don't want to have like a tier where I'm doing things for just these people who give me money and, like, and again, I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just that like. My own self, my own self governance won't allow it. You know what I mean? It's like I, I, it's just I don't want to deal with the headaches of what people say when you do things like that again. And I know for a fact that you guys don't do that, but it doesn't stop people being assholes. I mean, I mean, Danny, you're not asking for it, but from what I can tell, you every now and then also get donations and something like that. I get people. donations, yeah. but so, that's different. Yeah, that's, I, know, that's, I want to that's say that's that that's different than the subscription or something. But you still, if, if someone wants to show you their support for you giving yeah, yeah, away knowledge or, or talking to, yeah. to people, so it, that's that's another want, route. Mm. And it, it yeah, can I had a very well. like the the original question was how long? How what was it? How long did it take us to get into? In full time music, full time, yeah, 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 and 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 how to make a living out of it. I think that's super important. There's probably a lot of people that want to talk about that, and I don't, I don't know if trying to rely on Twitch and YouTube income is really the way to go about it. Um, but and it, it can work for some, but for me, I, I, the only reason why I'm able to do music full time now is because I found work somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? In another industry, and then chase uh -huh. my music passion on the side. I had to. I feel like if you're deciding to go into music, I feel like if you if you trying to make music work straight away is not really going to it's not going to help you because you're going to be forced to take any bit of job any work you can get you, you'll be forced to try and get donations or whatever do you know what i mean yeah. um i was a full-time teacher <laughs> teaching eight and nine year olds how to do maths for five years it took me five years every night i'd go home and do music to de-stress every weekend i would do music or whatever um and my teaching allowed me to then actually fund my music do you know what i mean and fund my passion my youtube channel became my outlet or whatever and that's where most of my content actually came when i had the full-time job now that i'm a, funnily enough now that i'm a full-time comp composer i don't actually have time to to stream much anymore or i'm not allowed to because of the content that i'm working on but yeah. um i really think that it's a smart idea to get a find find stability somewhere else and let music happen naturally so you can chase your passion you can chase exactly what you want to do and not be and not feel like you need to thrash music to try and survive you, you can really focus in on what you want um that can also that, hinder the process if you're entirely reliant on music to survive that's so, right yeah. yeah and well i got asked to be a music teacher and i decided not to do it because i thought it would kill my love of music <laughs> do you know what i mean like so for me it was always about how can i sustain myself while chasing my dream And if yeah. I get to do my dream full time, then then that's like the best thing ever, right? Um, yeah. And I'm, I was lucky that it worked out that way for me so far. Who knows? You might find me teaching maths to eight, nine year olds, you know, in a few years' time. Well, if I can pick Did up I on that, actually, um, I'm a I'm a full time piano theory teacher now, and I started maybe three, four years ago. But it, it's because of this teaching full time that I'm able to, like you said, purchase all the equipment you need and, and libraries and all that. Um, but the the path I'm taking is quite. Um, straightforward. It's like you, like like you guys have said, you can't really depend on Twitch and and YouTube revenue unless you have like a million and two million followers that yeah. get regular, you know, whatever every day. Um, so another th option to take is um, getting those viewers who are on your Twitch or um, YouTube videos and pulling them into a personal like closed system. For example, like an email list, like Alex has talked about many times. Um, but very but important. Right, exactly, because then you can um, you can continue to provide value to those people, but eventually, if you want to create content that's more in depth and create some type of online course like we've been talking about, we can always pitch to those people, and those people are considered warm leads because they've already accepted something that we've created for free for them, right? So there's like there's no um, there's really no limit, and it's totally scalable, scalable, I should say, uh, when it comes to that as we continue to grow our list because it's not. It's not dependent on other platforms like Facebook or YouTube or anything like that. Those things could disappear one day, but you know, if we have our own group of people who we can talk to and, and pitch to, of course, then 
it's always pleasant too. It's always awesome. nice. Yeah. Looking at Alex right now, being aware that it's 1 a.m. over at your place, I guess. Oh, damn. <laughs> damn. <laughs> uh, we are coming to an end with this. All I can say is thank you guys so much for taking the time. That was a good two hours we had this roundtable going. Thank you. Going. Thanks for having uh, us. I think mm -hmm. it thank was you, pretty awesome. We got some really nice insight on the side of being a composer on YouTube. Um, obviously, leave your comments and questions in the chat below. I'm pretty sure you guys will follow up in a couple of days if someone wants to know anything else. But I let, let us know how you liked it, uh, how you liked the, the format, and if you think we can do that more often um i appreciate any input on that thank you guys for joining and have a wonderful afternoon morning evening <laughs> wherever you are <laughs> by the way there's already a suggestion in the chat saying once a month so that's uh that's pretty pretty awesome <laughs> i will not make so any, promise, um, yeah. any promises <laughs> there not yet not yet not yet we should do it again we'll right? see, we'll i have see. to admit that i do like the format it's just uh more casual and, and, and uh, yeah, a little bit refreshing getting away from just hacking down on the keys or on the guitar or whatever and, and uh, doing some stuff with music but rather talk about it uh, especially yeah. in these times where we don't have much more possibility than uh, doing it on screen so uh, final for me to say thank you guys thank you all the viewers out there stay safe stay healthy and uh, hopefully until the next time all right you guys thanks <laughs> awesome. yeah, you, are, you all have a wonderful <laughs> yeah. day bye bye thanks guys bye thank you so much